Good morning, all. I will. I am Ms. Ashwini Sarunke. Welcome to One Week Faculty Development Program on Recent Development in Construction Technology, Addressing Infrastructure and Coastal Engineering under AICT Training and Learning Academy Program, organized by Department of Civil Engineering, Dr. D. Y. Patil Institute of Technology, Pimpri. We are starting our session in fifteen minutes. Concrete technology, transportation engineering, projects are industry sponsored based on societal needs and technical solutions to real life problems. Dr. Devi Patel Institute of Technology, Pimpri, is ranked in first 200 colleges in India, fourth in SPPU by NIRF, NAC, A grade institute with all programs, MBA accredited, civil engineering offers, UG with 120 intake, PG in construction management, PhD in research center affiliated to SPPU. The department is endowed with high caliber team of professionally inclined faculty members. The department has state of art infrastructure and well equipped laboratories like testing of material laboratory with universal testing machine, surveying laboratory. Concrete Technology Laboratory, Fluid Mechanics Laboratory, Transportation Engineering Laboratory, Environmental Engineering Laboratory, Engineering Geology Laboratory, Thank you. 
projects in the field of structural engineering, water resources, environmental engineering, concrete technology, transportation engineering. Projects are industry sponsored based on societal needs and technical solution to real life problems. Students enthusiastically exhibit their project in front of expert. Such platform boosts their confidence. Strong Industry Institute Interaction Center of Excellence by Dr. Fixit in the department. Also, the department has introduced new elective retrofitting and rehabilitation of concrete structures at SPPU. Benefits of Industry Institute Interaction to the students are sessions by industry expert, training programs, Workshops, seminars, civil engineering cannot be learned in four walls of classroom. Hence, the department provides internship program to students and ensures that every student do it effectively. Some of internship platforms are Pune Metro, BAI, LNT, Shirke Constructions. During this COVID pandemic, the department has provided online internship to the students, placement in core companies and software companies as per students' interest. Learning by involvement is the best technical knowledge. Teamwork and communication, presentation skills, model exhibition, to keep the pace with advanced technology, software training, are conducted regularly. Site visit to construction site, airports, water treatment plants, dams are conducted regularly. The department has established international student chapter with ASCE, Institute of Engineers India, CESA, Civil Engineering, Student Association, Srishti, and Environmental and Social Awareness Club, Antram, a cultural club, students also participate in NSS activity, by winning awards at international and national levels. Central Railways, PCMC, Water Resource Department, MS from reputed foreign university, MTech from IIT, NIT, and also successful in private sectors. Civil Engineering at Dr. D.Y. Patel Institute of Technology, Pimpri, a step towards excellence.
Over to you, Manisha Ma. Sorry, the Ashwini Ma. Thank you, sir. Uh, faculty vitality has been defined as continuing process of revitalization and self renewal that in turn fosters the attainment of personal and institutional goals. Enriching faculty vitality is key domain of teaching, assessing, research, professionalism, and administration in pursuit to improve educational environment. Faculty development program has been considered as standalone education pedagogy in fostering knowledge and professional skills of faculty. With this thought, I welcome all dear participants and our guest, Dr. Balaji Ramkrishnan, in the first session of Atal FDP on recent development in construction technology, addressing infrastructure and coastal engineering. Organized by Department of Civil Engineering, Dr. Deva Patil Institute of Technology, Pimpri. Welcome, sir. Now, good morning, sir. Uh, I welcome Dr. Balaji, sir. Our today's resource person, Dr. Balaji Ramakrishnan, sir. Sir, so we are audible. Uh, I'm making them uh, as a co-host. Yes, yeah. Yes. Yeah, so we'll do that. And uh, in, in five minutes means exactly at 9.30, we can start the session. Uh, we'll just make that other arrangements. Yes, thank you, ma'am. I request uh, uh, Ms. Kshitija Tikhe, madam, to introduce our today's resource person. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, Dr. Balaji, sir, is currently working as a professor in Department of Civil Engineering, IIT Bombay, since 2011. Earlier, he was working as Senior Coastal Engineer at Sograi Consultants in Dubai, UAE. Apart from teaching and research, he has been involving in several major waterfront development projects in the Middle East countries, India, and other Asian countries. His primary area of expertise include port, harbor, marina, coastal infrastructural design, and developments in general. His specific research domain includes numerical and physical modeling of coastal processes. Sir has obtained his bachelor's degree in civil engineering from Madurai Kamarjar University, obtained his master's and PhD degree in ocean engineering of research from IIT Madras. Dr. Balaji Sir has published his research works through three monographs, 58 peer-reviewed journals, 72 conference papers. Sir has also earned many honors and fellowships. To mention a few, Institution of Engineers India has awarded him with Marine Engineering Prize in the year 2018 and Institution Prize in the year 2015. Indian Society for Hydraulics honored him with RJ Garde Research Award in the year 2012 under the category of Young Scientist for Understanding Contribution in the Field of Hydraulics and Coastal Engineering. He has received Maritime Award in the year 2006 from Ministry of Shipping, Road Transport and Highways, Government of India for the part of his PhD thesis research work. He has won the Best Graduate Student Paper Award in the year 2002 from the American Society of Mechanical Engineers, Ocean, Offshore and Arctic Engineering Division for the part of his master's thesis research work. Dr. Balaji sir has presented several invited talks and research topics 
in many national and international forum he has been supervising number of masters and phd thesis research work in the field of ocean engineering dr balaji sir has been actively involved in several government sponsored research projects from ministry of shipping ministry of earth sciences and dst he has also been an active consultant for major ports maritime boats state government agencies and private companies we are very much glad to have such an eminent personality with us as a guest speaker for this fdp sir uh, with your permission may i request all the participants to switch on their video for a group photo uh is it done uh, shitija ma'am Uh, Ashwini ma'am, is it done? Uh, yes, ma'am. Just one minute. I yeah. will check with the team. Okay. Then, then uh, yeah, please then intimate so that we can start with the session. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Yeah. Uh, sir, I think you can. You will be able to share the uh, slides now. Uh, we can uh, after in, uh, that. Uh, you, we can check it out. Yes, uh, your presentation. Uh, Ma'am, uh, the group photo has been taken. Okay. Okay. Yes. Uh, yeah, we can I'm start good. with our session. I request uh, Dr. Balaji Ramkrishnan, sir, to start with the session. Sir, please. Uh, sir, your voice is not there. Please, uh, please check with the mic. Uh, whether I am audible to everyone now? Yes, yes sir. sir. Now it is. Yes, sir. So there is a small recap. We have been using several of the uh, online meeting platforms. Uh, Zoom, you know, Cisco, Dyson, so on. So each one of them, they pick the mic differently. Right, sir. Uh, I'm extremely happy to be here uh, to speak uh, in this forum as an inaugural talk. 
and i am also thankful to dr deepa joshi and uh, her team entire team of the dr patel institute of technology uh, i think they have planned it like at least uh, more than 3 4 months ago or maybe even much much beyond that actually i remember uh, beginning of this year I, they started making the program uh, they started contacting at least uh, you know all the resource persons and i at that point of time i told them that you know it is Uh, in august so why are you actually doing this well ahead of time and it is too far uh, from now to even to commit make any commitment but then it's really wonderful that you know they have been uh, following it up uh, very nicely uh, all throughout all these months and i'm really happy to see can maybe uh, participants in active participants as well in this uh, right Again, I am thanking everybody, uh, those who are actually behind this entire uh, program organization. Number one, and I am also uh, welcoming all the participants. You know, most like this is actually a faculty development program, right? Um, yes. Group, right? All of them yes, are. Yes, sir. All right. Faculty yes. and uh, even from industry uh, participants are there. Interesting. Very interesting. So yeah, this is advantage actually speaking. Uh, the gathering of uh, uh, the knowledge. Uh, you know uh, wisdom people you know it's easy for us to communicate you know what really wanted to uh, talk to them you know students of course they are different category also so you know you have to speak in their language you have to get down a bit and then speak in their language all that fantastic class is all of it so without making uh, much of time i would like to start the presentation um, when i uh, was asked actually by dr deepa or this on uh, the beginning Uh, title about uh, your talk and all that. Then I told them that let me give glimpses of what we do at IIT Bombay because we have a virtual division called Western Indian Council of our own. Rather than talking about a specific project or specific um, research work that we do, I just wanted to give flavor of what we do. Maybe you can uh, gauge or guess, or maybe if you really wanted to continue in that particular direction, you can contact us, or you can also do on your own from your own research. so that's the idea of the today's presentation so in case if you feel that it is like a garam masala like you know there are several flavors and several spices added in that uh, but sir did not actually speak anything deep about any particular subject uh, please apologize me because i'm going to give uh, the full flavor like a you know uh, uh, yeah, big, uh, hyderabad biryani uh, and like that so with that short note i would like to start the presentation i may Uh, likely to uh, skip a few slides uh, here and there. Uh, please bear with me because it's uh, it's a very generic presentation. So I would like to skip. To I'm 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 sure that you are able to see my screen right now, right? Yes. Yeah. 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 So that's the title slide, and I also go to the overview of that uh, before we go to the presentation mode. Uh, I will give quick glimpses of. Uh, neither the institute nor the department because it is all known to you and you can also browse a lot of information from the website but uh, very briefly about me and my background and about social engineering at iit bombay and uh, what are the facilities that we have developed in the past one decade of time r plus expertise in this so what are the uh, successful research projects and you know ongoing research projects i'll try to touch upon but um, since the time is really limited here i would just briefly touch all of these uh, maybe we will spend time uh, looking more wherever you know we feel appropriate and time to time we also in the you know in fact with industry i will try to touch up on that as well uh, i wish you know you keep most of the time your microphone uh, you know, uh, in the silent mode so that it will not actually disturb us and second thing i also request you to follow the etiquette of uh, you know the online meeting uh, let's keep the questions towards the end unless otherwise you feel that this is something immediately has to be addressed by the speaker like you know, then you can you know, just raise your hand or maybe i think that must be some way then for the data would have worked out you know in this situation okay. and also this meeting is going to be slightly curtailed in between due to the as it is uh, inaugural session as well okay so if uh, it is really required we can have further session uh, extended session uh, beyond the matter and moreover you know i am not very sure whether i will be able to finish the 30 slides in the two hour course time because each and every slide uh, that we have spent at least uh, minimum a year or two you know just just to, to bring that one slide you no know, it is not difficult to make a slide but it is difficult to bring the information to the slide okay 
so we have worked a lot uh, in the past 10 uh, plus years of time and uh, you know each slide speaks the volume probably when i explain you will understand and each of these slides are actually have uh, contributed contributions from uh, my own students and staff and my collaborators you know colleagues there are so many others i also have contributed a lot into this slide so this means that you know it is not just only this is balaji who has done all of this work alone right so i also want to take Uh, that's very uh, uh, sir just sorry to interrupt uh, your voice is little low uh, kindly uh, yeah yeah i'll try to keep the microphone as close yeah. as possible to the uh, yeah that that will be yeah thank you thank you and you are able to see the presentation mode now yes sir okay now you. it is in presentation mode yeah so yeah i i uh, think uh, they have mentioned about my education qualification and all that i also have uh, you know fair amount of industrial exposure before i come to the academics and i also had some industrial exposure at iit madras as well it's very interesting in fact dr deepa has sent me the program schedule you know a couple of days ago i am very uh, happy to see those uh, who are uh, uh, like my contemporaries those who are my teachers they are also part of this program very interesting they are going to be talking to you uh, today afternoon and tomorrow and day after and so on and my own colleague uh, my mentor mr dev is also going to speak to you so it's very uh, interesting program in fact uh, you know i would really love to attend the whole of this program but you know time may not be uh, allowing me to do so if you look at my own research interest uh, this is what i classify myself i spent um, and i also spending in fact the 30 to 40 percentage of my time in understanding the fundamentals you know the basics uh, basic physics or uh, basic dynamics uh, again relevant only to the coastal engineering uh, very specifically not uh, in general very specifically you know i spend a lot of time in understanding the basics of our coastal engineering and i also spend uh, quite an amount of time in the applied uh, coastal engineering you know applied science the reason may be because that you know i have got you know industrial exposure i've been working with the industry i mean the real world problem so that motivated a lot to me to spend more time in solving the uh, real world problem uh, you know 75 nearly 60 to 70 percent of the time okay so of course i will i'll uh, discuss about in detail about all of those uh, you know the uh, branches of the, the applied and the basic three uh, in, in the related to so very quick nutshell about our division at iit bombay and we are actually a virtual division uh, within the department of civil engineering and we are not a separate department as a whole like iit madras or iit parakpur uh, whereas we are part of the department of civil engineering and uh, you know we are four faculty members actually pervasing uh, in this virtual division uh, including me and uh, professor manas ranjan bagra is uh, my another colleague and uh, professor spinesh who has uh, recently joined us uh, just 6 months ago in fact and professor dev i think so quite familiar to all of us and he is also our mentor and senior faculty on that continue to help us in the teaching and research activities as part of our team well i think uh, this is also known to many of you uh, we were the uh, pioneer very proud to say that you know if you start any program Uh, related to uh, ocean engineering uh, in the early 80s and we also had uh, uh, one another mtech program in the past called offshore engineering i think that's where many of i think one of the speaker also has got his uh, mtech degree if i understand correctly uh, and we have revamped the whole program after i joined in 2011 uh, as mtech ocean engineering to give a more generic feel or appeal to the program and then it is successfully now running uh, in 2013 so all four of us together we actually cover a wide range of research expertise area uh, starting from design of marine coastal structures understanding the uh, dynamics through the modeling and uh, both numerical as well as physical and also we are very keen in working in the extreme events and their effects we collaborate a lot with the uh, uh the institutions the academic institutions within the country like i am speaking to you right now and uh, you know uh, we also have a large number of collaborative uh, initiatives with the uh, universities of other countries so uh, usa uk and so on i specifically have a very strong tie up with uh, scotland uh, university of edinburgh and uh, time to time we also work with uh, you know all the research institutions of our country national institute of oceanography ocean technology in science and so on it goes long 
uh, of course this is this is basically when whenever there is a requirement of such you know hand holding or hand shaking uh, kind of uh, requirement we do of course we uh, uh, as and when it is really required by the uh, industry or the public sectors we also do consulting services uh, you know, to specifically address those problems uh, unlike the research project we don't have the you know uh, comfortable a uh, time maybe this time will be restricted and the and the, and the problem is also very focused at the one person only their issues in so on after i joined uh, we uh, have actually um, uh, set up a wave uh, tank in our uh, hydraulic laboratory and this was in 2013 i think you must be uh, knowing professor dev who is about to break the coconut to inaugurate this facility in 2013 and professor eldo and others were actually working with it. and i was the one who took this picture for you can see me there so yeah this this facility uh, of course is like 50 meter long um, compared to the facility that i have enjoyed during my masters and phd time at iit madras this is really small and also a, a simple facility i would say but to begin with you know we we have started building this and it is 50 meter long 1 meter by 1 meter cross section and nonetheless uh, there are some uh, speciality or i would say some uniqueness of this facility compared to the facilities uh, located elsewhere it could be like an iit calicut or coral or it could be on the iit character and so on but this uh, computer controlled wave making system which is actually fitted on one side of the wave paddle is some prevent air tank is completely customized by us okay so though it is procured from uh, you know, the overseas company but then this has been completely customized a lot by us that it can even generate the waves that cannot be even generated in other test facilities in our country so of course we do have publications based on that we do have a very good experience and the uh, phd students have passed out of that and so on so so there are some uniqueness of course of this facility as well so uh, uh, just to add uh, value to those uh, facility testing facility we started procuring number of uh, laboratory equipment so some are basic and some are uh, little uh, research oriented uh, for example wave gauges and the test sensors we also have a one dimensional laser doppler velocity meter applied uh, through project funding and uh, acoustic doppler velocity meter which can actually give a volume of uh, you know uh, velocity measurement and so on and currently we are developing one another wave tank if you see in this pictorial uh, you know view uh, the tank on the right hand side is basically the one that we have already built and uh, using it and the one that is actually little elevated and painted in green color is the one that i am going to talk about right now it's basically a wave current flume uh, again we are thinking of bringing some uniqueness you know so that it will be uh, standing uh, you know very good uh, facility for our research students and in addition to that uh, as a special case we really wanted to have indigenously designed wave making system for the new upcoming uh, wave tank so this is going to be including procuring the motor writing the program to control the you know, wave paddle displacement and all of that are going to be completely in house and of course you know like everybody is uh, facing the brunt of uh, covid you know it is also let me uh, slow down uh, for us as well yeah this is little highly uh, sophisticated uh, Uh, you know equipment i would say um, that we have procured uh, through uh, dst funding and uh, this is basically infrared cameras you know we got from three cameras and one uh, uh, conventional camera uh, the the uh, advantage of this particular uh, instrumentation system is that you can measure any uh, displacement or for that matter all the six degrees of freedom motion you know those who are working in mechanics and fluid uh, you know uh, the floating body dynamics will understand what i am trying to uh, speak uh, the all the six degrees of freedom motion can be captured i mean any any object that is you know actually floating or it is actually moving without making any physical contact to that uh, object or the body basically so uh, this is a uh, little expensive and we have procured and we also have successfully tested and uh, some of our own uh, students and staff have got some kind of a training from the uh, swedish company and it is commissioned in 2019 nearly end but then again covid picked up so we are yet to utilize the fullest potential of the uh, facility yeah apart from the uh, uh, off the shelf ready made equipment we also use uh, a non conventional measurement system of our own uh, it is not actually following any standard protocol but you know we established the protocol of our own in fact uh, the images that you have seen in the previous couple of slides are actually 
procured you know you basically buy it from the supplier you know potential supplier you give specifications and then you buy it from the supplier but some of the research work you know i also motivate the young minds uh, why don't you crack something new let us establish our own measurement system and things like that so the one that you are seeing on the screen at the moment is basically a game uh, box or uh, to I, i'm not sure how many of you have seen this before uh, microsoft xbox xbox is meant uh, the black uh, picture that is shown in the middle of the slide today is basically meant to play games uh, computer games or animated games okay so you just have to keep the sex box behind your back and there will be a television in front of you and uh, just by simply moving your hand uh, you know like that just like that you know you can play cricket or you can play tennis or you can even play baseball on the other side on the screen as an animated version of your uh, hand movement and you know your body movement as well. so all of this will be captured by combination of infrared as well as the conventional monochromatic camera both are fitted in a particular angle in this xbox this is purely meant for playing games okay so we thought you know why don't we use this for engineering um, studies so i actually got a very interesting intern from uh, uh, solapur one of uh, the uh, young engineer uh, who was actually doing summer internship with me he says you know 18 year old or 19 year old kid and then i asked him can you do this exploit this whole thing i know how to Uh, explain this so what is the requirement but you may have to crack you know how to use that you know fullest potential and things like that so he came down i said like why can't sir so he i gave him a task of actually understanding how a submerged breakwater that is actually shown here on the uh, uh, left top uh, corner of the slide that a submerged uh, rubble mount breakwater if it's actually subjected to some kind of a a uh, storm condition uh, waves of uh, actually you know uh, larger magnitude and also continuously battering the uh, sea wall then uh, we wanted to know the profile after the uh, the cyclone passed that uh, 6 hours or 12 hours whatever that in prototype and in our laboratory it will be something like equivalent to 1 hour or 2 hours of continuous wave attack on this profile then uh, to measure the exact profile or movement of the individual small rocks it is going to be really tough you know i think it is not uh, really possible to make any physical contact to measure how it was originally oriented and how it is actually moved out and all that are actually extremely difficult to do but with this uh, xbox we have cracked uh, the jinx and you know we have actually nicely captured the change in the entire profile and just not as the individual stones but the entire contour of the profile contour before contour after of the entire uh, submerged breakwater profile has been nicely captured by the textbook so this is this is one just you know example of how we slightly go and out of box thinking uh, is actually bringing some fruit nice some research fruit out of the effort yeah we have done that a few times in fact and we are uh, really successful uh, all of those times so this is actually another customized proximity sensor which is useful to measure the uh, heave displacement of a particular uh, floating body bank well uh, many of our own students you know they like to do uh, uh, so some uh, some experiments because we have got some facility uh, this is actually some glimpses of how our students have actually spent their time in uh, experimenting their models and get some useful data yeah some other students you know they are uh, not so lazy but you know they are not actually interested in going and wetting their hands or maybe Uh, sweating out and interacting with others we just wanted to sit in front of the computer and do their entire research work so for those of uh, you know uh, who we suggest them okay do some kind of a numerical equivalence uh, of the experiment but of course you have to validate that every time uh yeah, if you don't mind uh, somebody can uh, mute uh, Yes, I will check it immediately. Yeah. All right. So this is another uh, uh, PhD work. Uh, she has sent. Yeah. Thank you. So, so uh, this is another uh, PhD student's work, and it is eventually uh, led to an uh, Indian patent, actually. So, I just wanted to spend some time here to explaining, you know, what we have basically done here. So, we have actually coined and conceptualized the concept called the dual-purpose wave energy caisson. Uh, for the simple reason is that 
though we do have a, a good amount of wave power spread uh, across the indian nays and this coastline they are no way you know near uh, to the kind of wave power that the uh, northern latitude countries have like you know european countries or uk northern part of uk so we obviously naturally not so gifted in tropical waters i mean in the mid latitudes uh, so we cannot really help that i think this is natural gift um so i within the short or sorry within the small uh, amount of wave power that is available along the indian coastline they also vary in season you know for example during monsoon we get good amount of wave power along the uh, west coast and uh, rest of the year you know they are very normal i mean uh, you you may not be able to uh, extract a lot of electricity from these wave powers we also have learned the lesson in little hard way uh, through one of our own uh, pilot scale that the only one pilot scale that was installed in india uh, long ago so keeping that in mind you know we have come up with a concept called uh, the uh, dual energy dual uh, energy oh, sorry, what is this oh, yeah. so this is the uh, conceptual schematic of what we have proposed and this has already been filed a successful patent indian patent so uh, this is basically a yes, uh, perspective of the uh, chambered breakwater you know the breakwater uh, uh, has got uh, some kind of a perforated uh, front wall and it has got a impermeable wall so this can act like a perfect uh, uh, breakwater for any uh, new project or any protection of coastline and so on so once the waves they come in uh, they also get partially trapped within the chamber the chamber uh, between impermeable wall and porous wall they are going to not they are not going to be completely trapped because this is still porous wall so the re reflected waves can always pass out of the porous wall and back into the ocean always but then when you adjust the size of the chamber uh, to match with every every basin has some kind of a natural frequency so when you actually try to match the natural frequency of this chamber uh, nearly with respect to the uh, design wave incoming wave then probably we can create some kind of a quasi resonance condition inside the harbor i mean inside the chamber okay. your harbor is protected anyway by the impermeable wall there will be no bit of energy of wave will actually pass through it so absolutely no problem so we are talking about the wave uh, chamber inside the uh, inside which you know we can think of amplifying the wave characteristics incoming wave characteristics for example if there is a one unit of incoming wave approaches and gets into the chamber then you know we generate some kind of a, see we we basically create the quasi resonance condition so that the wave height will be like you know uh, some 30 percentage 40 percentage increase then we can think of having any wave energy converting devices devices like you know it can be uh yeah, a single axis um, a spherical buoy or it can be a cylinder it can even be there are number of concepts that has already been proven that they are very good in in, in extracting the energy or electricity from the waves as a wave energy converting device they are point point absorbers basically as a, not as a long structure they are like point absorbers you know they just move in one particular direction constant location so they can generate electricity so to Uh, prove that you know the hypothesis of whatever we are imagining or whatever we are actually thinking of in our mind to be really correct or true then obviously we need to have some kind of a systematic study right so we begin with uh, i know individual wave energy converting devices alone tested in our laboratory and we have got the energy equivalent to that i mean the electricity generation equivalent to that in our hand then we place the inside this chamber uh, again this has also been tested uh you know inside the uh, in the same wave tank and then we try to compare you know whether they are going to give us some kind of enhanced wave energy and we are very successful in that sense so there are many publications if you are really interested in knowing more about this particular work you can always uh, write to dr deepa or to me you know we'll be happy to share those let us say publications as well but then the measurement is little uh, challenging of course we need to have some kind of a um, specialized uh, you know uh, the vertical movement alone being actually allowed for this spherical wave boy to go on up and down so we again have got some kind of a convention non conventional uh, measurement system of how yeah so while we progress in proving our hypothesis at the end we also have tested various performance of the uh, combination of p chambered breakwater and the wave energy device being kept inside Uh, for various parameters like you know it should not compromise the reflection characteristics it should not compromise the very purpose for which the breakwater is being built you know uh, so it should absorb the energy as much as possible within the chamber and uh, nearly create some kind of a quasi resonance and try to extract the electricity from that 
and then when it goes out back again it should be as minimal as possible as a reflected energy so that you know the very purpose of the breakwater is not being defeated so that's the whole idea so yeah that's about the uh, laboratory experiment and the student of course uh, she also has extended her uh, you know uh, efforts in the modeling the same scheme in the numerical uh, uh, tools as well and uh, time to time uh, in the past 10 years uh, we also felt that the collection of the real physical oceanographic parameters uh, there are some parameters of course we can always borrow it from nio or niot or uh, incais has a very good nice uh, database a repository of the actual field data whenever you ask them you know they always happy to share that with you but then there are some specific data that may not be available with any of these agencies okay so then what will happen you know you will actually end up in assuming something or you know uh, uh, not being these results are validated so your research findings are always being questioned so what we thought let us also create the not so big but the uh, field measurement capabilities that sufficiently cater our own requirement i mean our our research requirement basically okay so in our team so over the years we have started procuring number of equipment that can be deployed in the open ocean not in the laboratory this is open ocean for example the picture that is shown on the right hand side uh, top corner is basically a recording current meter uh, of course these are all uh, procured from uh, our uh, standard suppliers so this recording current meter uh, can be deployed in a water depth of uh, 100 meters if i if i understand the memory correctly so but it it has also got number of uh, sensors fitted in that so that it can measure the uh, waves tides pressure temperature turbidity there are number of parameters it can simultaneously measure apart from measuring the uh, current velocities okay. so the picture on the uh, left extreme top is basically uh, acoustic uh, you know current profiler uh, it can be installed actually in 300 meters of water depth though we don't really go there but still uh, we are actually intent to uh, go a little uh, far away beyond the continental shelf also in the future and so this will certainly help us in measuring the uh, current profiles at various uh, water column of the 300 meters thing yeah there are a number of other equipments like uh, gps drifters that we have uh, you know uh, procured from our own collaborator in taiwan uh, this is uh, capable of capturing high resolution surface currents you know you just have to throw them in the open ocean probably i will try to explain uh, uh, in one of our case studies in the subsequent slides that how we use the potential of all of this equipment in in detail we also have a, a very nice miniature wave boy again uh, you know in collaboration with our uh, taiwan counterpart and uh, we have developed this uh, yeah as uh, as part of our uh, field measurement capability that we know we have procured other equipment also and recently we have procured another edcp and lot more to come in fact yeah but these are all some of the upcoming uh, upcoming uh, you know equipment that we are thinking of procuring through uh, various research fundings um, uh, this particular equipment is uh, very unique and pretty expensive too uh, they i think the whole system will cost you uh, nearly 3 crores or something like that but but we are thinking of actually starting with something very basic here uh, especially in the places where uh, we need to examine the underwater conditions and in those places where the high turbidity i am not very sure how many of you have uh, gone to place like uh, kolkata or kandla or even gulf of kambat and places like that the water is so much murkier because of the strong currents murkier in the sense they are so much uh, uh, turbid Uh, that the suspended sediment concentrations will go in several uh, hundreds of milligram per liter uh, for example you know if you dip your hand uh, at the surface of the water up to your wrist level okay not beyond that not necessary to be beyond that you know once up to you dip your hand up to the wrist level you can't see the edge of your own finger that's the kind of turbidity i'm talking about okay so you may always love to visit places which are crystal clear like uh, you know andaman lakshadweep and maldives or maybe mauritius but unfortunately not all the coastline will be a crystal clear blue lagoon a nice looking uh, you know you can see the bottom or coral or fish and all that is never going to happen all the time okay, so in those places if you really want to uh, uh, assess some condition of a marine structure or offshore structure or what is actually beneath the underwater even if you have a highly sophisticated uh, uh, conventional optical camera it could be like you know a lac or crore or whatever 
they can't see anything because you know that's the uh, you know visual depth that you can see not more than some 10 cm beyond that you know you'll not be able to see anything okay so in those places only the uh, sonar speaks uh, the three dimensional sonar uh, three dimensional laser only they can speak you know they send pulses receive the pulses back and then they they also acquire the images of uh, you know these are one of one of some of the uh, you know pictures that i have flicked from the internet but i'll show actual our own case study of using this uh, because we don't have the equipment at the moment uh, at our disposal but we have hired the services of some private company i will try to show you uh, maybe how it uh, really helps us in understanding the uh, condition of this marine structure in a murkier condition like that yeah this will be useful in mapping the pipeline orientation and uh, i mean i'm talking about offshore pipeline or uh, for, for example the marine structure may look really in very nice above the water level but then below the water level it may have kind of corroded and the concrete might have fallen so all that can be uh, captured to millimeter accuracy or sub millimeter accuracy using this sonar system they're pretty expensive of course well, so i think uh, that, that, that's all about our um, you know uh, capabilities and you know the uh, the so called uh, facilities that we have developed so far in the past uh, 10 plus years of time i am actually going to go to the uh, different research project before that i just wanted to give some kind of a overview of what is our basic approach or what is our uh, fundamental approach uh, my approach is always very simple of uh, either uh, our approach is always very simple uh, you know we really wanted to study any dynamics as comprehensive as possible in nature in very simple terms uh, you may uh, ask, you know ask, ask, ask me what is uh, comprehensive or why is it really required that you know you have to study this dynamics in, uh, through a holistic approach okay. so i will give couple of slides of example of where we stand in understanding as a human kind you know understanding the coastal dynamics and then you will naturally tell me at the end of third slide from here that uh, yes sir actually whatever you said is correct that you know it basically require a holistic understanding not just a random one or two uh, things that you know you pick it up from uh, pick it up from is it either based on your expertise or based on what is basically required yeah so this is of course our my own perspective and you know correct me if i am wrong anywhere in between so there are of course some kind of a natural challenges I, I, I would like, really like to start with a small pictorial representation of how the coastal dynamics can actually vary in large scale in space and also in large scale in time. Okay, I think this is known to all of you. Then this picture is basically from some author. I have clicked it because I just wanted to start the explanation using this pictorial representation. So look at these. there are of course uh, short uh, periods uh, information like you know the uh, temporal scale can start from uh, uh, minutes to days to weeks and so on it can go all the way up to millennium in the y axis and in terms of the spatial spread it can be as small as you know few uh, meters and then it can go all the way up to several uh, thousands of kilometers in the in the spatial domain okay so i'm not going to explain all of them here but look at a few of them you know this is my own classification again there are some events which are instantaneous like the capillary wave you might have seen or you might have heard these are all surface tension based the small ripples or waves that can they they can form in your tank or you can uh, probably create it in a bowl of water by just blowing it on top of that so these are all instantaneous information and it is not really interesting to me you know i am basically engineer so i am interested in little larger the event than the, the, the instantaneous information there are of course events like cyclone like storm like monsoon season i'm talking about or it can even be tides okay so so if you look at their scale uh, they may be uh, you know few uh, meter to all the way up to some 10 kilometers in the spatial scale and they you know months and weeks it together in the in the in the, in the temporal scale and so on but this is engineering again this is where most of my interest my personal interests are actually lying here it covers again a large amount of all of your uh, you know maybe i would say that you know even some engineers together actually is cup of my tea okay so uh, rather than just only engineering so what happens if you build the infrastructure like a port when you construct a port what happens you know it may eventually affect uh, tens and tens of kilometers along the coastline both ways down trip as well as up trip yeah i think there are many case studies 
uh, the subsequent uh, you know resource persons will also be speaking about that a lot that the infrastructure development should really be uh, seen right from the inception or maybe even early in the in the, in the feasibility stage that keeping all of this uh, dynamics in mind okay so in terms of time as long as those structures are actually existing like 30 years and 100 years it could even be sometimes you know 100 years you know this dynamics will be influenced all throughout that uh, temporal scale okay so you have to keep that in your mind and there are of course a very long uh, time scale and you know very large scale i think people who are working in climate studies they may uh, think about this and certainly this is not my cup of tea okay so i am not a climate science uh, you know a faculty here but maybe they are interested in how uh, in the long term how it really evolves whether they are evolving naturally or they are evolved by or influenced by the anthropogenic uh, you know situations or climate climatic condition of the other regions for example if you have a if you have an interest in the arabian sea but then it may be influenced by some effect actually happening in pacific and you know or it may be due to the global warming circulation and so on so but i'm not uh, actually so much interested in understanding that there is also a specific reason why i uh, emphasize the holistic approach is that the dynamics are very complex even if you are a civil engineer not necessary to be a coastal engineer i'll tell you the the uh, dynamics of the waves are different dynamics of the tides are different and if they are meeting the uh, the natural river water system or you know land based water system like estuaries and creeks then the dynamics is quite complex in those locations okay so all of this is going to certainly influence your understanding of the coastal dynamics for sure and we are talking about only the hydrodynamics I and mean, there is a sediment involvement then the morphodynamics is also going to be quite complex there are places where you expect erosion there may be a deposition where you expect deposition there may be erosion or one simple example is that uh, i'm not very sure how many of you know that is that the uh, sandbar formation in front of the river mouth uh, the river just before it joining the open ocean anywhere along the east coast or west coast there are classical examples of river mouths along the orissa coastline and classical examples as of actually in uh, west bengal examples is in andhra pradesh beautiful examples in kerala the river mouth and the sand spit formation or bar formation is every time unique you can't come to a conclusion that next year immediately after the monsoon the sand bar will be this shape this size is going to be here no there are studies done by our own scientists elsewhere in you know other research institution that they are have actually uh, face this challenge they fail to crack in you know how to really predict this sand formation uh, sand bar formation i'm talking about one single river if you analyze the 40 years of satellite data each and every year there will be unique formation it's really hard extremely difficult it's the quite natural uh, challenge that you know we all face but we are happy to uh, that happy to accept as it is okay so there are some locations where you feel that the waves are dominating there are some locations where the uh, waves the tides are dominating or sometimes you know during the monsoon or you know uh, the place, locations like narmada and godavari river uh, discharging they are so powerful uh, in terms of discharge they may even influence the coastal dynamics because of just their discharge alone okay well i also have a uh, you know uh, other reason why we need to understand this in a holistic way is simple as that these complex dynamics that i have mentioned so far they vary basin to basin okay when i say basin bay of bengal is a basin arabian sea is a basin red sea is a basin uh, arabian gulf is a basin for example it's a large scale basin i'm talking about so they naturally vary basin to basin but what is more interesting to me and maybe to you is that they vary within the basin also for example in arabian sea the dynamics are actually totally different they are mostly estuarian or river dominated along the kerala coastline as you move up uh, the karnataka coastline mostly you know this is these are all very generic statement you know so don't take it like a like a like a statement in a you know, research statement that i am giving here okay so uh, when you go up further north the uh, karnataka coastline is influenced a lot by waves and uh, as you move further up uh, towards the maharashtra south border and you know goa coastline there are locations where they are both tide as well as wave dominated and once you try to enter into the gulf of kambath uh, very close to the gulf of coastline 
the tide is so much dominating compared to the waves and other other features okay so there are uh, less waves but then more of uh, dominated by the wave uh, sorry tides so you must be knowing about the tidal amplification along the gulf of kambas right so the 1 meter tide 1 meter the tide is actually basically the 1 meter height of the tide when they enter into the gulf of kambas they naturally get amplified every day i'm talking about and that they can even reach to all the way up to some nearly 9 to 10 meter high amplitude uh, tidal uh, sorry tidal range uh, and the up north in the end of gulf of kambas it's a quite an interesting of course we also have a specific study uh, on our own uh, to establish you know this dynamic cycle duplicated in our country so there are some locations again where tide and river can dominate together in uh, places like narmada okay narmada being you know one of the largest river and discharging a huge amount of water and sediments they alter the entire dynamics you know you can't really set up any model that can really capture the dynamics of this narmada river mouth etc and so on so it is extremely of course it's challenging i mean i don't want to say that it is difficult but basically the nature has posed the challenge and we really love to uh, uh, reach out actually as much as possible well so any uh, infrastructure that you develop in, in these regions you know uh, dominated by various uh, physical oceanographic parameters then you should really be cautious that whether it is going to influence the dynamics in the vicinity so you need to obviously have some kind of a, a predictions of uh, the futuristic scenario forecasting of the scenario which obviously requires some kind of a specialized approach so unless you have a comprehensive understanding of this region either in terms of temporal scale or in the in the, in the spatial scale i am sure that you know we will fail to capture the the effect of the any infrastructure development that is proposed yeah so uh, yeah again uh, you know just you know to make this whole presentation as a complete uh, package i just put only one slide of uh, theory otherwise all of them are going to be a uh, pure practical relevance uh, so just understand uh, just to understand you know again what are the challenges that we face in terms of the computation modeling the previous slide that i tried to explain to you is purely based on the natural challenge that we pose to us all of us you know, it doesn't really matter whether we, you know you are working uh, as a researcher in uk europe or america or you know africa but these are all natural challenges okay but similar challenges is also there Uh, in terms of uh, capturing those dynamics into our computers okay so i will just try to explain with one simple example and it is uh, is a uh, you know more more of a common uh, you know generic appeal where we understand hydro as well as marco dynamics which means you wanted to understand the hydrodynamics and and subsequently you wanted to know the sediment transport and the movement of the sediments is subsequently due to the hydrodynamics okay let's let's keep that thing but i think it's quite familiar to all of you uh, in this forum that the uh, waves wind generated waves are actually transforming and then they coming very close to the coastline so whenever you go to beach you will be able to see the waves are breaking so when there is a wave breaking and from that point towards you along the beach towards you i mean where, where you are standing on the beach the dynamics are yet to be understood in spite of the fact that you know the coastal engineering science has actually have gradually advanced over the past more than uh, at least uh, 100 years but still the dynamics within this zone is yet to be completely understood you may be surprised you know so you know uh, you know with so much of experience i am telling you we are yet to crack many of these dynamics completely blank to us blank all right so let's capture that it's actually a very simple uh, flow chart of how we usually set up our model in understanding the bed profile you know when you go to beach you know you stand on the and on the beach sand right so that's what i am talking about the bed seabed so the seabed how it changes uh, it can be like you know wavy pattern or it can be ripple pattern whatever you know it, it can basically be uh, in a different pattern depending upon the dynamics of that area but how it actually being influenced if there is a monsoon season or how it is being influenced by a particular cyclone which actually not more than uh, 24 to 72 hours you know it is going to last in that particular coastline so let us keep even the small temporal information okay let's one one particular cyclone alone let's take that way so due to one particular cyclone how the profile of the bed of a particular beach you now it can be a beach in ratnagiri or beach in goa or it may be now if you are living on the east coast you know a beach along the chennai or vizag or wherever okay 
so there are of course waves and currents this we are supposed to estimate in your numerical model i am not actually going to give you all the details of the equations and all that but i will of course show you some of this then you need to estimate the hydrodynamics first and then you should also go down little bit depth that you know it should also be uh, giving the interaction between the uh, the the uh, hydrodynamics or the kinematics of the water particle and the sediment particles because these two are totally different the sediment particles are actually simply lying down if there are no waves it is not going to move okay so but now the kinematics are actually brought by the waves and they are going to be transferring that to the sediment layer so it will be in suspension or if they are heavy the particles of the sediments are actually heavy they cannot be lifted by the wave kinematics but they can be rolled uh, at least pushed by the waves so this can go as a bed load okay so this bed load and suspended load the moment you receive some kind of a kinematics they are bound to move from their original location i'm talking about not the entire beach not the entire sand i'm just talking about one few one or few sands uh, particles i'm talking about so eventually all of them contribute to the uh, the bed evolution or the so called morphological evolution so okay so i'm sorry i think we sara some of the equations that we i'll quickly pass through don't have to panic there will be no question about this equations and all the you know the component of these equations absolutely no uh, keep cool and no don't panic okay so in order to understand for you to get the evolution of the bed uh, change in the uh, bed evolution uh, z or z value is basically z value is basically what um, uh, the uh, uh, depth of the seabed from with respect to some kind of reference level let us assume that way so how it is changing with respect to time so that is basically function of some kind of a morphological parameter i will come back to that but that is component uh, that is actually function of both your suspended load how much it is being lifted and transported forever or far further or how much being pushed little away uh, maybe uh, some 1 km this way or 1 km that way or 1 km towards the land or 1 km dragged by the waves towards the ocean whatever the direction it can go in all four directions with respect to a beach that you are talking about okay so it is a function of the suspended load and it is also function of the bed load if you keenly look at the equation which gives us how the suspended load and the uh, the bed load will actually be mobilized in terms of their equilibrium they are further function of the so called currents the currents are actually i'm talking about combined currents the currents can be due to waves tides any salinity variation any temperature difference or any density difference all of them together or it can even be due to the global circulation it can be all of them together in any place that you go out in the open ocean when you measure the field the currents in the field they are combined currents of all of these events i mean all of these physical parameters okay so they are function of currents in two different directions one is uh, the suspended load will actually be influenced by the currents in the vertical layer of the water column whereas the bed load is purely influenced by the currents at the bottom of the seabed the currents of the water particle of the waves are very close to the bottom well what happens in addition to that you know you also have to worry about what are the inputs that i am supposed to give should i we only worried about the waves and currents or should i be including winds or should i be including the energy losses due to the wave breaking bottom friction or uh, any of the turbulent event all of them you know you should think about in one direction and if you carefully look at all of this equation as i told you you don't have to panic that you know you have to muck up or memorize this equation look at very carefully all of this equation there are n number of empiricality involved in this okay i want to emphasize once again all of this understandings of a bed simple bed evolution of a beach profile due to a particular storm is built on top of several numbers of empirical equations empiricality okay so and i wanted to stop here there are many empirical information actually built here that you see that bottom shear function which is a boundary layer concept that is actually another complexity that we are talking about okay so when even if you assume a simple wave theory can describe 
the wave breaking point all the way up to the wave breaking point which is not true okay ideally but still even if you assume that the simple wave theory is actually sufficient enough to describe the dynamics of uh, the waves all the way up to the wave breaking just before the wave breaking the bottom boundary layer which may not be more than some 10 cm or 15 cm is completely neglected in those theories number 1 number 2 that is the location where the waves actually impact with the sediments and this is not known to us well this is not just known not known to me alone it is not known to everybody who was working in the coastal dynamics okay so i'm not actually ashamed of that but i'm proud that you know we are actually at least aware that we don't know many things okay rather than saying that i know many things it is better that you know you get to know more and more of what you don't know then probably it will actually push you to learn uh, or at least make some kind of a genuine attempt towards learning that actually okay. so this is the um, another reason why you know so so your numerical models are generally built on top of these equations it can be finite difference or finite element meshless or you know any number of you know highly sophisticated that equation you can talk about eventually it will boil down to you know few uh, you know control equations like continuity of mass or continuity of momentum or conservation of energy so if you look at very carefully all of these equations there will be terms additive terms they will actually be function of your uh, uh, shear forces or maybe some kind of empirical equations from you may have naturally default values given in the program in the computer okay but you have to be very careful those default values set by somebody else and sitting from europe or us is also going to work for you along a coastline which is actually in front of goa along a coastline in front of your kerala coastline or for that matter anywhere else in the it is coast of india so it is our duty to check that how will you check that or how will you validate that or how will you ensure that whatever i'm doing is correct the assumptions that we make in the, the numerical models are correct so again you need some kind of a holistic approach to it so randomly if you run the program give some input definitely it will give output i think we all know the famous statement by all of our uh, you know engineers saying that garbage in garbage out this is computer program okay. but then it's all written by engineers of course they also have set of guidelines you know you have to follow that and they also have given some kind of a limitations of each and every program they also have given some kind of a criteria with which only this program will work so beyond that you know you have to test it on your own i think that is kind of disclaimer is also given in every single program all right so let's actually talk about the resources in challenge i think this is another part at the time of the so the best way to understand the coastal dynamics or marco dynamics is actually to make in situ measurements i think this is known to all of us okay so sir, how will you understand sir along the coastline i'm proposing a port uh, now along the uh, you know uh, goa coastline how will i understand the effect the best way is actually to make sincere effort to make some kind of in situ measurement deploy some equipment measure the physical porosity parameters but the challenges are actually different that's whatever you measure from the in situ measurements uh, provided if your instrument is actually of good quality and the specifications are actually perfectly matching your requirement then what whatever you are measuring is the ground truth or the actual dynamics in that location but you have to be making sure that the equipment is really good and you may have to do a, a calibration of that instrument also before you deploy and make a measurement of waves or currents okay this is another cautionary note i want to say but how many locations you will install actually such kind of you know uh, equipment they will be really expensive you cannot actually buy some thousands of adcp and deploy all along uh, you know you had a uh, goa coastline or maharashtra coastline then even 1000 may not be sufficient you know so it is very difficult actually. so in terms of a uh, spatial uh, uh, spatial representation of the measurement you will fail to do so in situ measurement even though it is comprehensive in situ measurement you will fail to capture the dynamics in this spatial domain number one number two temporal how long you can keep the equipment under the water forever six months one year even one year also it is quite challenging because the marine growth will form on top of your uh, adcp sensors and after six months uh, whatever the data is collected will be zero values any parameter current parameter waves all of them will be completely zero in your excel spreadsheet after you uh, retrieve the equipment from the underwater and then you 
you take out that you know memory chip that is inbuilt in that so it cannot really uh, make uh, such kind of uh, you know long period uh, in temporal scale also we have some kind of a practical uh, limitations you know we cannot actually go on so you basically can't get long term measurements and any field measurement can't tell you how it is going to be uh, in the future if you have a if you have a if you have a you know a proposed scenario um so that's another uh, you know challenge that you know we have well numerical model is a very good tool uh, which can uh, cover large uh, spatial domain for example you can model the entire arabian sea in one single program in your model or maybe the entire bay, bay, bay of bengal on the other hand uh, you can also cover the uh, temporal scale uh, starting from days to years to even decades also you know you can run the program and then go uh, for a cup of coffee or maybe you can uh, come after you know one week and the computer will keep calculating the information maybe it will give you at the end of uh, 10 days or one week or something, whatever it is uh, a large temporal scale that's another interesting uh, uh, advantage of the numerical model so in numerical model you can both go back in time and you can also go forward in time uh, both hind casting and for for forecasting is possible i think this is known to all of us okay so once you have the set of program uh, with you then probably you know you can uh, estimate uh, back in the time and forecasting time also that is not possible in this case well as i said before very simple these programs are actually having set of equations number of unknown parameters plenty of empiricality inbuilt so you have to calibrate without which the results of the numerical model is not no use to any one of us okay so uh, of course this can be used for prediction in case you know if you want to understand the effect of a port uh, proposed port development along a coastline probably you can set up a numerical model and introduce the uh, port layout and then try to understand what is the effect of that in the latest stage and so on well this is where we also have the powers of uh, remote sensing i think i i have uh, a number of case studies which are very successful uh, because the, from uh, satellite you know you can basically cover a large spatial area uh, you know there are some cameras you know which are actually looking at the large scale area and you can capture the dynamics on one side and of course these are all sensor based information they capture only images they don't capture dynamics as such okay so from the images to the original oceanographic parameter or any engineering parameter that you want to derive there are some algorithms that you have to follow so they are not straight forward information just by taking a picture then you know you cannot tell that you know the wave height is this much you know currents are due this much you cannot actually uh, blanketly say like that so you need to write some kind of algorithm and the those algorithm will purely be based on the actual in situ measurements in the beginning okay so these are all kind of interlock so your numerical model also need in situ remote sensing also need in situ but in situ cannot be actually long period and so on so so what i am trying to tell you here is that there are advantages of each one of these resources i am talking about okay and there are limitations as well so if you are actually sticking to one of these resources alone to understand the coastal dynamics i i would say that you know probably will fail to capture the information or will fail to capture the actual dynamics as well and in addition to these listed resources we also have analytical tools we also have probabilistic tools for example sir i have long term data can i use just uh, simple uh, data driven uh, techniques like uh, ann or you know genetic algorithms you can always use you know uh, you can also use probabilistic approach like sir actually i have long data can i connect project it it's up to you if you are so confident you do that go ahead but then for all of this you need some amount of information known to you already so who will give where will you get these are all the questions that i am talking about in any particular project that you are talking about it may be available generally somewhere else you know and there are some uh, you know scenarios or situations where we may also have to employ uh, physical modeling tools also uh, those dynamics which cannot be represented by these you simply go to the lab set up your own uh, you know model and then see whether you can mimic the real natural scenario and whether you can make some kind of a measurements from there whether you can actually make some kind of a uh, judgment and so on so 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 these are the background why most of our projects from next slide onwards that i am going to explain will actually be 
as holistic as possible okay so i am just making the you know the uh, preamble here that because of the natural challenge because of the uh, the uh, resources and the numerical modeling challenges we right from the beginning have gone through a concept of holistic approach so every single research problem you try to address from various angles possible so through our research experiences from the subsequent slides and the industrial experience if time really permits us to do so i will try to explain and what are our expertise in the field of engineering okay so i'll have a sip of water if you don't mind all of you uh is it fine uh, uh dr deepa all these uh, slides that we have spoken so far anyone uh, from the organizing side yes sir sushma am i am really audible right and you have been listening to all of these slides otherwise i will be speaking to the wall and uh, no no it's no, sorry yeah you audible and uh, slides are also uh, clear no issue sir fantastic fantastic you know i used to check that in my classroom because otherwise uh, i will be assuming that you know everything goes on fine but i might have come out of the network at times you know, so true sir true true i will be speaking to the wall all the time yeah so past one of us i have been speaking to the wall yeah no students yeah yeah, yeah i yeah. hope yes <laughs> fine let's go to the uh, next slide so i will uh, uh, rather um uh, walk you through some of our uh, successful research project that we have completed uh, again like i said before each slide this particular slide now we have spent three solid years to bring this one slide okay so i am going to give only glimpses of what we have done and through the pictorial representation i have a natural tendency to i mean i have a uh, my own way of explaining things so i usually use the uh, pictures to explain the uh the importance of research project as well well uh, for the uh, uh, maharashtra government uh, state government we have done a research project uh, thanks to their uh, generous funding that we are able to hire staff and you know set up some kind of infrastructure computation infrastructure and so on the primary objective of this particular project that i am going to highlight in this particular slide is that we wanted to capture the dispersion characteristics or this the spatial and temporal spreading characteristics of any accidental oil spill of mumbai coast line okay so slightly of the offshore of mumbai coast line there is a very strong motivation or reason behind this because all the past accidents along india all the major ones are actually happen in front of mumbai coast line be be mumbai being busy navigational route and major connecting two ports are actually located in our in our city so it's quite natural that we expect a huge amount of vessel i mean ship movements in and out of the ports so it's also quite natural that you know there are accidents do happen but during these accidents uh, there are at least a couple of accidents that probably i can spell out one is in 2009 and another one is 2010 if i am not remember correctly these are all major accident that really created environment havoc okay disasters then see one side whom to blame whom to be put in responsibility and all that is one side and other side is how to mitigate how to even uh, combat in case if there is a accident that has already happened how to minimize the ecological and environmental damages to the existing situation so this is another side so let us not get into the first part but we are more keen in addressing the second part okay so in case if there is a accident what will happen to those uh, spilled oil please remember this ships that i have referred to uh, you in the case of 2009 and 10 i think the two accidents they are not oil tankers if those are oil tankers the scenario would be catastrophic okay luckily those two were not actually oil tankers both were cargo vessels but cargo means in you know, a container basically one is a container vessel so in spite of that the oil spill is large because these ships are very large and they carry huge amount of uh, engine oil of their own uh, 
you know engine uh, running for purposes you know they have huge store huge oil so the first case was actually msc um, uh, kalija if i understand correctly there is a ship named called kalija it was grounded nearly 50 kilometers off of off shore of, of, of uh, mumbai and it starts sinking and there is a huge amount of oil started spilling and coming towards the coast and other one is actually head on collision by msc chitra and one more uh, ship uh, they had a head on collision actually they, they hit each other uh, you know uh, straight uh, uh, each other it's just in front of the mumbai port in fact very close to mumbai port and that they spilled huge amount of oil also see first and foremost is that these two incidents have happened during monsoon number one number two these two incidents have actually happened very close to mumbai city coastline and you are left with a very small amount of time to react or to do any combative measurements imagine if the oil is actually spread like a thin layer along the open ocean to several tens of kilometers can you really take it out first of all if it's a container or a solid object probably we can scoop but it's very difficult even before we realize they reach the coast line so number one all this actually has happened very close to the coast line so you have very less reaction time and it's all actually happening during the monsoon period and that's also should be put in our time and it is mostly happening only in front of the mumbai coast line because of the moment it is natural so with this mindset you know we uh, propose this, uh, you know to develop some kind of a small graphical user interface uh, basically operational oil spill dispersion model exclusively for mumbai so yeah uh, so uh, exclusively uh, for the mumbai coast line so we use of course like i said before combined advantages or powers of the remote sensing modeling in this particular project to begin with well why we need remote sensing because any of the operation oil spill that i am going to develop for mumbai coast line has to be validated which means not just only the hydrodynamics the waves and currents winds but also if i really leave some amount of oil in the middle of the coast line in the numerical model and the moment of the oil spill spreads along the space in time whether that is correct representation of the natural or not where will i go to get such data there is not a single data available in situ measurements in the whole world forget about forget about us okay there are some laboratory experiments yes but those are all controlled experiments now you create a small tank and leave some oil and then you generate some nice uh, clean regular uh, say single mo sinusoidal monochromatic waves and then you understand the physics uh, dynamics of the oil spill that is not going to work out in the open ocean your waves are not going to be like your wave tank so what will you do the only way to uh, learn how it is spread is through past incidents and there are no in situ measurements during the incident so the satellite information is the only option we are left out with of course there are of course huge study i'm talking about nearly one and a half years we spent on understanding the past incident alone and that i have shown it in one single pictorial presentation in this slide this is actually a um, uh, this is a head on collision of the uh, msc chitra in front of the kolaba area okay this is a snapshot of after see your satellite is not going to give you directly this picture okay the one that you are seeing on the left top corner is not given by the satellite directly there is large amount of uh, programs and algorithm that we wrote we clear those those actually which are uncertain uh, look alike because the satellite capturing many times you will feel that you know this may be oil leak or oil spill uh, uh, from the image but it is actually not it may be a ship trial a ship when they go no uh, so they also leave some small trial behind so there are chances that you may be mistaken so you have to make sure that even those algorithms are actually perfect in this particular case there is no in situ measurements so all of your algorithm should be based on the uh, information that are actually reported in the newspaper reported by uh, for example the uh, shipping companies or reported by ministry environmental uh, you know, agencies so using all of this information we come to a conclusion that okay the algorithm that we have developed to fine tune to arrive this kind of snapshot of the oil spread is correct number 1 number 2 you can get only snapshot of the information you are do, you are not you, you don't get a movie from the satellite imagery right so it's only a snapshot one time it takes and then the 
the satellite will move further it may have it might have gone to uh, north of uh, arabian sea or somewhere else to europe and so on so it will take one snapshot so you have to remember that these are actually uh, high expensive uh, satellite information we didn't have those information at least in our country so we purchased it from the canadian agencies and each one of this snapshot cost you nearly 3 lakhs one photo without any processing what i have shown here is all processed by us so they gave you one snapshot so you have to be really cautious in selecting those snapshots uh, even before you procuring them you should be very sure that what the information that you want you can't spend in buying large amount of satellite data and, and uh, ultimately of uh, redundancy and so on so we have carefully selected two incidents and only two satellite snapshots that we have part but of these two accidents and uh, based on that you know we have set up the numerical model initially we estimated the uh, hydrodynamics in this was actually validated with uh, data thanks to you know uh, of course many agency have actually contributed if i understand correctly we even borrowed some data from sirolli uh, peras borrowed some data from nio and so on so at that particular point of time this project when it was happening we didn't have any field measurement capabilities of our own so we were banking uh, hugely on other uh, uh, repositories so at the end once we confident that the uh, oil spill dispersion characteristics estimated by our numerical model is exactly matching with the snapshot of that particular day for example if the accident has actually happened today then uh, what will happen on the third day uh, how the oil spill would have spread will look like so that is what actually shown here in the satellite imagery okay so once you have the similar situation which means you are capturing the dynamic as well then we developed a small uh, graphical user interface and this was in fact uh, given free of cost as, uh, as per the government of maharashtra request uh, free of cost to um, all the major stakeholding uh, agencies like you know the mumbai port trust jawaharlal nehru port trust uh, bpcl hpcl maharashtra pollution control board uh, coast guard in fact uh, maritime boards ongc we have given supply to this uh, software free of cost to them because they are the major stakeholding industries which may be interested in understanding the oil spill dispersion characteristics of mumbai coast guard and this small gua can uh, once if we have a any futuristic uh, you know incidents has happened we just have to give the coordinates the approximate coordinates of that location and what amount of oil may be spilled out out of this ship and all that then it is going to give you a uh, 10 days of uh, prediction of where this oil will end up whether it will actually go end up in the north of uh, mumbai coast line or south of mumbai coast line or exactly to the mumbai coast line so all of this can be estimated in less than 30 minutes of time so that is the reason why i was actually mentioning this as a operational oil spill management so this can give us a, a very nice uh, advanced information about the spill oil yeah this is one such a numerical prediction of uh, oil spill scenario within the tane creek uh, uh, what you see is as the white patch is the uh, mumbai city and i am sitting somewhere down there okay so this is tane creek and you must be knowing and this is uh, <clears throat> uh ulaz river and wasai creek well yeah this is another uh, interesting project um, maybe interesting to you uh, dr deepa you please feel free to stop me you know uh, about the iacp program uh, i will stop wherever we are at, okay okay sir all right so this is another uh, uh, interesting research project uh, carried out uh, single handedly by one single mtech student of course i really uh, wanted to make uh, this mention in every single forum because it involves so much of work but it was all done by one single mtech student a very fascinated uh, interesting student so uh, uh, of course uh, th this was also uh, extensively studied by uh, uh, cwprs if i understand correctly uh, uh, you know we have dr agarwal also i think uh, is shown up just now uh, welcome sir so so uh, this is actually a navigation channel which are yeah, uh, which is connecting uh, both uh, mumbai port trust as well as jnp okay. so navigation channel is uh, artificially dug uh, underwater this you cannot see of course when you go in the in the open sea through using a boat you cannot see this this is going to be completely under the water because the ship requires basically certain amount of water depth for safe for sailing otherwise they will be getting stuck in the ground so we dig some kind of a channel artificially now this is called navigation channel so the pilots are the captains of the ship they know how to 
follow these navigation channels to reach the port or how to come out of the port uh, and things like that. Okay. So these channels are actually artificially brushed to create enough water depth for a safe navigation of the vessel. But then they also get silted up by the dynamics. You can only dredge out, but then this is filled by the nature. These two ports are being located uh, very close to the mouth of the Tanik Creek. You know, they are uh, facing both the seaside dynamics and also the Ulas River based and Panvel Creek based, all of this uh, groundwater based uh, uh, flow conditions and including the sediment dynamics that they are bringing in, they get uh, usually silted. Of course, uh, you know, uh, the ports will, they always be spend, spending some amount of their um, revenue in keeping this brush every year and then things like that. But then it was our curiosity, research curiosity to do exactly estimate how much quantity is actually silted up every year. Okay. Once if you have some kind of a fair idea, probably we can give some kind of a solutions to that. Or maybe we can, uh, even if there is no solution, because these are some of the solutions that, you know, very rarely we find any, um, sorry, these are some of the problems, natural problems that we find very rarely any solution, particularly. At least we'll get to know, okay, for next 10 years, we are going to spend this much from our packet time. That's no problem. Okay, let us be prepared. That way. Okay. So what we did here is we have combined uh, the powers of the field measurement, modeling in the computers, and also some amount of laboratory uh, exercise. Okay. The laboratory is not the wave tank, but I'll tell you about that. So the student went out and he spent at least, uh, if I understand correctly, some three weeks inside the open ocean uh, uh, using a boat hired from uh, uh, the local agents. And he made some kind of a three different location measurements where he uh, you know, deployed some equipment. He captured not only the waves and currents, but also the uh, turbidity using the turbidity sensors. Okay. So these sensors, again, another challenge here, that these sensors basically measure some tur turbidity information in a weird way because, you know, the, the natural the characteristics of these sensors because they are at that design. But even when you wanted to know what is the amount of suspended sediments in these waters from these turbidity sensors measured using the equipment has to be validated. You may be wondering, sir, what is this, you know, you're talking about Validation of validation of validation of validation. Yes, it is actually like that. So when you want to really make some genuine effort, you may have to do all of this holistically. Sincere effort. Okay. So the turbidity sensor has to be validated. So what we do, we collect physically the water samples, undisturbed water samples at every one hour. And then those samples were actually brought to our laboratory. We filter them. So that the sediments which are actually present in one unit, for example, or one liter of water, for example. And then there are actually there are some kind of a standard experimental methodology or procedure or protocol that we are supposed to follow. At the end of the day, after having spent so much of time, what you will get to know is basically what amount of sediment transport, sorry, uh, suspended sediment concentration is available in these waters. So many milligrams per liter. It may be sometimes one single number. But that one single number to be obtained, you know, we have to really do all of these exercises. Okay. Only then you will feel that, yes, I'm confident enough to put that in my numerical model. So once you have those numbers with you, uh, spread across the different, uh, you know, uh, uh, physical oceanographic conditions, you know, we do, of course, systematic effort to uh, collect this information in different uh, physical oceanic conditions, for example, high tide, low tide, or maybe spring tide, late tide. So I am I, not actually explaining what are those keywords, but let us not worry about the jargon that I use here. Okay, basically different scenario or different uh, physical conditions of the open ocean. Well, we were very successful. I think our estimations were very close to uh, what was realized by the uh, surveys uh, carried out by these two boards, so JNPT and MBPT. Uh, and of course, you know, we also have the uh, publication based on this particular project. <clears throat> like I said before, we also spend quite an amount of, uh, at least some amount of time in understanding the fundamentals or the basics. Okay. So I'm not very sure whether it is time to stop here and... Um, uh, uh, sir, yeah, uh, sir, actually, um, we'll wait for some time, just two, three minutes, they will be start. AICT will be starting with inaugural uh, session. So I think what we'll do is uh, uh, instructions for participants will be announced here. Right now we'll stop here uh, as far as this session is concerned. Okay. And after the inaugural, we'll continue that. So uh, I request Ashwini, Madam, any instruction for participants, please.
Dr. Deba, is it okay if I uh, little exit the meeting of a couple of phone calls and then join later? Yes, sir. Definitely, no yes, issue. Yes, sir. Thank you. Yeah. You can always message me. I'll be because available we, on WhatsApp. Yeah, 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 sir. After the inaugural, definitely just five minutes prior to that, we will contact you and uh, we'll continue with that. Yes, sir. Thank you. Okay. okay. Thank, thank, you, thank you, sir. Thank you, ma'am. AICT has organized inaugural ceremony of 39 adult FDPs at 11 a.m. The chief guest uh, is Professor Nagarajan Ramamurthy, director of IIM. Guest of honor is Professor Anil Sahastrabuddhe, Chairman AICT, and advisor of Atal Academy program, Dr. Mamta Agarwal, will be advisor. Now we will con connect you all here only for inauguration session. So I kindly request all participants to attend the session, and then we will continue with Dr. Balaji's session here only. The attendance and feedback link will be provided during the question and answering session. So I request all participants to continue with our inaugural ceremony and then Dr. Balaji's session. Thank you.
A very good morning to all of you. Ma'am, can we start with the proceedings? Yes, please. please. This year and the last whole year has presented us with innumerable, unprecedented challenges and has forced us to pause and really reflect for each passing day. The very fact that even with this ill posed challenges and impediments at every step, we are able to meet virtually and be a part of this grand initiative of AICTA Training and Learning Academy, and UTL as it is called, is really a blessing. So it's my privilege to welcome all of you on this occasion. I, Dr. Vartika, on behalf of I am Abritsa, would like to express my heartfelt welcome to our chief guest, Director Professor I am Professor Nagarajan Ramamurthy, Director I am Abritsa. Our guest of honor, Chairman AICT, Professor Anil B. Sahasri and advisor at the Academy, Dr. Mamta Rani Adhikarati. And I also welcome to the core team members of Atal Academy and IT staff members of Atal. I would also take this opportunity to extend my warm welcome to all the program coordinators, technical staff members, and participants who have spared their time to be a part of this brand occasion. AICT in its endeavor to encourage academic excellence in technical education has taken several strides, including emphasis on the development of faculty teaching in colleges across the country. The AICT Training and Learning Academy, one such initiative which has been conducting various activities in upgrading faculty's knowledge in trust and emerging areas, has scheduled 
to launch all online 39 such FDPs which are starting today. These trainings will be conducted by some of the top institutions of our country, IITs, IIMs, NITs, ISCs, and many other prominent higher ed institutions. Without any further ado, I would like to first welcome our first eminent speaker of today, Dr. Mamta Rani Agarwal, who is the advisor of Atal Academy. Actually, the dynamism that she carries, she does not need an introduction, but I will just try to mention some accolades from her career. She is former Joint Secretary UDC, Director Education New Delhi, and from the first batch of lady pilots in Indian Air Force. She has been international speaker at the University of Columbia, Department of Public Policy and International Affairs. She has compiled and edited five volumes of reference books on the national education policy. Over to you, ma'am, for your welcome address. Am I audible? Yes, I am. A very good morning to all of you. Heartiest welcome to distinguished chief guest of the inaugural session, Professor Nagarajan Ravamurthy, Director IIM Amritsar, a very visionary and dynamic academic teacher, our very own Professor Sahasra Bhutte, visionary, very, very affectionate, and our favorite, Honorable Chairman AIGT, Shukla sir, who is heading Indian Knowledge System at uh, AIGT, eminent friends from Academia, our dear coordinators and lovely participants. It is indeed my privilege to address this August gathering on one of the most prominent and value addition scheme of AICT, and that is faculty development. Atal, or we very, very fondly call it Atal, but it is actually AICTE Training and Learning Academy. I am reminded of few words of APJ Abdul Kalamudi, our former president. Teaching is very noble profession that shapes the character, caliber, and future of an individual. If the people remember me, of course, he's talking about himself. If the people remember me as a good teacher, that will be the biggest honor for me. Trust me, the influence, the impact of a teacher, we don't know where does it stop. It carries on for generations and generations and shapes the ultimate destiny of a community, of a society, of a country, and of a nation. It simply emphasizes these powerful words of Kalamji, simply emphasizes the need for passionate, energized, motivated, and committed faculty members. Now, how do we create these passionate, energized, motivated, committed faculty members? Vartika has very clearly mentioned that AICT in its endeavor has launched these programs, these faculty development program in niche areas, in core competency areas, only with this objective in mind. And we are in the field of tertiary technical education. So tertiary technical education is both. It is aspiration of more and more young people around the globe in our country because we, we are a very, very young economy. And it is a fundamental requirement for employment in industry that drive the global knowledge economy. As such, tertiary education provides unique opportunities for individual development and equity of opportunities as well as promoting shared prosperity. A well-managed, strategically oriented, diversified, and articulated tertiary technical education is vital for producing the caliber and diversity of graduates needed both for the economy that exists today and for economy to which our nation, a $3 trillion, a $4 trillion aspires for, our honorable prime minister has given us that aspiration. So for providing skills for immediate professional application to building the stages of complexity of learning towards postgraduate studies, towards research, Tertiary education offers limitless avenues for social mobility, inclusivity, and economic development. But how would it happen? It would only happen if our teachers are competent, 
they have the subject knowledge, they consider themselves as the custodian of moral values of our country, they take pride in being Indian and Indianness, our heritage and culture, and they are energized, they are coming. It is in this direction we are trying this. Atal Academy has actually been awarded by the Book of Records in London for having the largest number of teachers being trained. However, this time, our focus, our favorite challenges are the quality. The quality of this relevant, meticulous, comprehensive, continuous teacher training, which we are doing continuously. And though, because of COVID pandemic, everything has changed. The learning teaching process has changed. It has become cross-institutional, cross-cultural, multi-directional, where students are equal partner in the knowledge, uh, uh, knowledge uh, creation. It has enabled beautiful convergence of men and machine. Our pedagogies have changed. Our landscape has changed. But it has also offered a great opportunity, which all of you have heard, tech of distance. So we can actually train more and more and more teachers in four areas. We are trying to establish a great industry academia linkage so that you hear from our uh, industry friends. We had the first session on 26th of July where CEO of Cadence India Limited spoke to you. On 23rd of August, we have ST Microelectronics and Arm India CEO would again be addressing you. On 6th of September, we would have SAP and Microsoft uh, India head again addressing you and explaining you about what it is needed by the industry that academia need to create for an effective knowledge transfer and human capital from academia to industry. We are also trying to create an effective system of taking feedback from our participants, but the onus is on you coordinators. Unless you become our agents of change, unless you become our extension, our extended arm to provide these Atal Academy trainings with utmost dedication, with utmost commitment, with utmost sincerity, we would not be successful in our end. In this end. At the end of it, we want that each and every teacher of ours, after these five days FDPs, when the person goes back, he feels much more confident, he feels much more competent in the core subject, he feels much more confident of effective delivery mechanism of the core subject and is able to transact the training in these niche areas, in this four areas much more effective. My dear teachers, you are the one who can actually change the entire landscape. You are the pillars of quality education deliverance, custodians of our moral value, responsible to transform lives, young lives, into competent, cutting edge humanitarian technocrats who encourage inclusivity, commemorate diversity, celebrate Indianness, our Indian ethos, and finally celebrate excellence. Thank you so very much for your time and coordinators. Once again, I request you to give your 100% for very effective faculty development training that applies. All the very best. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot for those as aspirational and inspirational words from your side, ma'am. Our next speaker, uh, do we have uh, Anil sir? I think sir, he would join in a while. So meanwhile, we, yeah. we can. We will. Yeah. We will our honorable uh, chief guest and our service. Yes. 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 This yes. Sir, can host the academy play. Absolutely. Our next speaker and the chief guest for this occasion is our inspirational director. Professor Nagarajan Ramamurthy, who in the last two years of his term and full time as full time director of I am has taken the institute to newer heights. We really consider ourselves lucky to work under his tutelage. 
Dr. Nagaraja Ramamurthy received his PhD in business management from the Robert Ed Smith School of Business, University of Maryland, and at College Park. Dr. Ramamurthy has taught a variety of courses in the management discipline at both undergraduate and graduate level. He spent a semester at the University of National and World Economy in Bulgaria as a Fulbright Scholar in 2008 and was a recipient of the second Fulbright grant to teach and research at the University of Applied Sciences, Balmeria Latvia. He has lectured at the Indian Institute of Management, Ahmedabad, the University of Applied Sciences in Australia, and many other prominent institutions of the world. He also received the university's research and scholarly excellence award in 2008, the Distinguished Service Award in 2009, and Best Reviewer Award for European Management Review awarded by the European Academy of Management. He has published his research in leading journals and presented his work in many known international conferences and has also been on the editorial boards of some of the top journals in the area of HR, strategy, and organizational behavior. So I now request Sir to please deliver his inaugural address. Uh, Professor Ramamurthy, I saw uh, Anil Sahasrabhutte joining. So since you are the chief guest, sir, you know, maybe take him for a few minutes if you allow. Uh, Professor Ramamurthy, can you hear me, sir? Yes, yes. Uh, Am I audible? Sure. Anil, sir, Anil, sir, can you speak for five minutes, sir, Sahasrabhutte, sir? All right, sir. I think we'll go ahead with your address and then we would request, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Respectable chairman of the ACT, Dr. Manik Sarsabhote, Dr. Mamta Agarwal, faculty who are teaching the program, participants of the program, and Professor Vartika Data program coordinator for the project by FTP taught by I am Amritsar Patali I want to welcome all of you to the Atal Academy FTP offered by I am Amritsar. It is indeed my honor and privilege to address all of you today. Let me compliment all the participants for their high level of motivation and commitment to self development by participating in the faculty development program, Project Thrive. It clearly shows your desire and motivation to continue, continually focus on your self-development. Today, I want to focus on three things. One is uh, the nature of teaching profession and why I consider that as a very noble and notable profession. The second aspect I want to touch upon and discuss briefly is the changing environment and mainly the role of technology in the field of education. Finally, I want to emphasize the need for continuous development and uh, learning by the faculty members as part of a broader self-development initiative that we all should be focusing on. Turning to the point of teaching profession, I personally consider teaching profession to be the most noble and notable profession in the world. It is true that doctors, engineers, nurses, other philanthropists, and so many other uh, administrators, uh, administrators, all of them make a contribution to the society. I'm not here to undermine their contribution. However, what I do find the difference between those professions and what we do as educators is this. We do have a very profound effect on the individuals or the people that we try to serve. We make a very permanent mark on the lives of the people that we try to educate or we educate. The effect teachers have on the students he is very enduring and permanent. A doctor, for example, may treat a patient for three days, the patient uh, gets cured, and with that, it is over. 
here, when we teach a student for two years or one year, then we have made a re remarkable effect on their career, on their future, in, in uh, the broader sense on their lives. Most of us can reflect upon our own past as students and realize that you know, we may not remember all the people that we work with or even interacted with. However, most of us, or I would presume that all of us, remember the teachers who taught us from our elementary school onwards till to the higher education. We do not remember them simply for the knowledge that they imparted, but because they had a distinct impact on our lives in terms of who we are today, the values that we have inherited or we have developed, and in a broader sense, our own personality. We may or may not like all of our teachers as each educator is different. Each one has a different personality, a different way of delivering what they want to deliver. Some of them might have been very harsh on us, and somebody else might have been very sweet or soft. Some were more likable, some were less likable. But one common thread that permeates among all the teachers who taught us and as teachers what we do is that they kept our interest in their mind. Similarly, today we are keeping the interest of our students in our mind whenever we do what we do. Our teachers wanted us to be better citizens and good, good human beings. Therefore, we owe a debt to our teachers simply because they shaped us. Today, we are in the same profession and we are trying to get the next generation of people ready for the future, for the real world, for the society. So always keep in mind that you are making a very big difference in the lives of the students that you are educating. In this process, your role is not simply to be a teacher, but also a mentor, a coach, and a leader. You have taken the responsibility to ensure that students who are educating turn out to be great citizens in the future. As long as we produce students, who in the future might turn out to be better than us, we should actually take pride in our own job or what we have done. That is, we have made a remarkable difference in the lives of the student as well as the society in which the student is serving. Finally, I also want to emphasize that we have chosen this profession because of the our own choice. Most of us, have options elsewhere. For example, we can be administrator, we can be in civil service or in private sector, industrial based entrepreneur, we can name it. But we have chosen this profession as a choice and it is a big and most notable and noble profession. We should try to make sure that we deliver the very best for our students. We should strive to provide our students with a holistic education and shape their personality in a very positive way so that they remember us as well the society remembers that the contribution uh, that we have made has made a difference in the society itself. Turning to the point of uh, the changing environment, in the past 30, 40 years, even 50 years, the education sector has changed considerably. What we teach, the concepts, principles, they have been relatively stable, although like the content also changes over time. However, where the biggest difference has come is that as teachers, we have tools today that were not available several years ago for many people. One of the most important changes that I want to emphasize is the role of technology. The present generation of students are more tech savvy than the previous generations. In many cases, they're even more tech savvy than myself or ours, ourselves. They are more adept at using them and exploiting, exploiting the learning opportunities. Internet, 
various learning management systems which are customizable, customizable to individual learning styles and needs of Hawaii. Due to technology, we are able to reach out to the farthest parts of the world, regardless of where the students are residing or where the teachers are residing. Gone Academy, for example, has several courses available for students to learn. Due to the pandemic, we may have resorted to this uh, online education, not because of a choice, but because of uh, the conditions imposed on us by the pandemic. However, online education and blended education will eventually become the norm in future than an exception. It already has to a great extent, but you know, it may not have permeated completely, but it will uh, in the future. Do we consider these changes as a threat to our existence as teachers? Or do we consider these as opportunities to explore? In one sense, I can say that we can use technology to help us become better teachers. We have to embrace technology in such a way that students can learn the concepts through various available means outside of the classroom. The next question is, what do we do in the classroom then, you know, if they can go to Khan Academy or do some, uh, watch some videos online. Here, we can actually focus on the value added part of education inside the classroom. Ask yourself, how can we make education more meaningful and engaging experience for the students? The classroom actually provides the tools or the time for engaging in that more meaningful experience for students. Activities, applied learning, uh, translating the knowledge to some real world problem solving solutions and so on and so forth. We should create an environment focused on student learning through engagement while exploiting technological tools that are available to us. Technology is not a substitute for in-class learning, but they are certainly a very good supplement for us to focus on and use in the classroom. Therefore, I request all of you to reflect upon how you can adapt yourself to the changing environment and also in the process, redefine your role as an educator or a teacher and make education more meaningful for the students as well as the society. Or how can we make the education a holistic one for the students? The last point I want to focus on is the role of self-development. In addition to the technological changes that I just talked about, over the years, research in the areas of learning theories have enriched our knowledge about the variety of pedagogical techniques and tools which we can use as educators to enrich the learning environment. These tools uh, this uh, the, knowledge, the research knowledge was not available several years ago, but this is more accumulated evidence that we have uh, gained over the years. For example, like you know, much is known today about structured versus unstructured learning. When is structured learning suitable and when is unstructured learning suitable? Right. Similarly, we also have knowledge about face versus mass learning. Then also we know about whole versus part learning. We have also, through research, know more about learning characteristics and the learning styles and which type of pedagogical technique would be appropriate to certain individuals and which will not work for certain individuals. The research also has focused on assessment outcomes. What is it that we want our students to gain? Is it just a pass mark in the high school or college or degree, or is it something more than that? Research also has informed us a lot about content development and curriculum development. Needless to say, the research also has shown us, for example, like how do the instructor characteristics influence the learning and engagement that takes place in the classroom. 
Finally, like as a new NEP policy talks about, we also have the room taxonomy. Like, you know, whether we want an age appropriate curriculum and what type of skills they must acquire and so on and so forth. So, let me suffice uh, or summarize it by saying that education is a function of the teachers, the content that we are trying to do, the tools and techn techniques available as well as the learning characteristics, is a complex, interdependent, and interactive phenomenon. These are only some of the things that came to my mind, which I mentioned, but surely there are several other factors that you know we need to really consider, for example, the socioeconomic status of the person, um, and the uh, parental family influence on learning, so on and so forth. The, important thing for us as educators is to reflect upon not just the content or what we are planning to teach, but also how to more effectively deliver what we intend to tell. As educators, most of us know, for example, I teach a class today. When I come back, I know that did the class go very well or did the class did not go well. Right? If it went very well, I need to focus on why it went well, what worked and what did not work. Or if it did not work very well, I said, say, why did it not uh, elicit the type of responses or engagement of the students in the, in the learning process? Therefore, one skill as teachers we have to understand is uh, to develop, as part of self-development is to be our ability to reflect upon which strategy worked for us and which strategy did not work for us. I'm not saying that the same strategy is going to work for everybody, but each one of us has a unique strength. And we need to really focus on that unique strength and then see how uh, technology as well as the uh, curricular issues, the learning models, learning theories can all help us in becoming or shaping us to be a better teacher. That is the answer to the question of why a strategy worked or did not work is very critical. Therefore, in your self-development activities, as part of continuous learning, please do not just focus on the content, but also critically examine the other aspects such as student characteristics, content, methods used, etc. We should be in a position to adapt our method to suit the audience. This reflection will help us become better educators. This will also help you transform your role from being a teacher or simply an educator to a mentor, coach, and a leader in shaping and helping the audience that we are trying to address. We become more a facilitator, take on a different role than what uh, your teacher is narrowly defined as. Unless we change as educators, unless we focus on learning, are improving ourselves. The products that we produce, that is the education we provide to the students, will be incomplete. Finally, I want to comment on the Atal Initiative. The Atal Initiative by AACT is very commendable. The educational ecosystem has changed, and the Atal Academy also has changed in the sense that you know, now they are able to reach out to broader audience through these various webinars and uh, these type of uh, inaugural addresses or uh, FTPs organized online and so on and so forth. These are designed to help share knowledge among ourselves. This program, as well as the other programs that we are planning to attend, now as well as in the future, will provide you with additional food for thought. At the end of the day, when you return to your classrooms, please reflect upon what you're learning in these programs and see how these programs can help you change wherever change is needed and to make the best use of the opportunity provided to you. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot for those reflective and thoughtful words from your side, sir. 
Our next speaker, I'm sorry, I'm interjecting our uh, Professor Sahasra Bhutte, our Honorable yes. Chairman. Yes, yes. So, may we request, sir, to say yes. a few. Chairman, sir. Yeah, thank you, Mamta Rani, as well as Pratikha Dutta, for giving me an opportunity. I'm traveling, and so sometimes connectivity. It is all the less I was carefully listening to our chief guest, Dr. Nagarajan Rai, director of IIM from Dutta. And almost all the facets of what do in educational institutions, from the teacher's point of view, from the student's point of view, as an educational institution, has been carefully told by him in many, many words. And therefore, I need not repeat some of those. But nevertheless, two things are like, uh, you know, what we say, revision is required. And therefore, I will take on from what he said in terms of access. Today, all areas of the country, including some of the rural areas, are connected through an internet. And therefore, when during pandemic, we started off with the classes in an online mode, we were able to reach out. But there are certain difficulties. Some places, there is a difficulty of connectivity being not stable. Sometimes the internet may be there, but some of the poorer children. So there are some challenges which we have been addressing day in and day out. And hopefully in a couple of months time, when the robust Bharatnet connectivity is established that all the villages of the country, probably this problem will be reduced substantially. But nevertheless, he touched upon quite often about the value system and how teachers are going to be a very important role players in the entire education system. Because teacher is the one who remains in that system for about three to four decades. Students come, batches come, they will be there for three or four years and go away. But the teachers, if they are not trained well, and if they are not understanding the pedagogical aspects very well, uh, the kind of products, the next generation being prepared will not be of the good quality. And that's why focus on the teachers is very, very important. And the new national education policy talks about teacher education as one of the most fundamental things as far as uh, the higher education is concerned. Uh, she also talked about structured and unstructured learning, different learning styles. A lot of research has been happening. But I would like to reflect that in our ancient traditional knowledge system, Indian knowledge system, there are 51 different styles of learning. You know, in the modern era, we have touched about seven out of eight of those kind of things, not the 51 of them. We talk about classroom lecturing, we also have tutorials, we have laboratory classes, we have experiential learning, we have project-based learning. We have, have different types of uh, various ways of teaching learning, as well as the uh, styles of learning. Maybe visual, maybe sometimes in terms of uh, experience. <laughs> so these are numbering about eight, eight, ten. Are given. So most of these we have. So can teach a student a particular topic through uh, play through painting. I think people would probably not be aware in the Western world as to what significant things India had already done. And therefore, when we are talking about pedagogy, we have had a teacher certification program of eight modules. senior faculty member. We can't hear you, sir. Sir, we have lost connection. As far as uh, Professor Nagarajan, Professor Nagarajan was rightly pointing out about values. We have a three-week student induction program for inducting students into the mainstream. Uh, students coming from different backgrounds, 
and for training faculty members we have faculty development program for universal human values so the diversity of activities that icit has undertaken in the last four years where uh, in the induction programs health and yoga ayurveda historical places visits maybe archaeological sites sports exercise meditation these are all very very important aspects of life which are also part of the holistic education which the new education policy talks about and through variety of faculty development programs we are inducted he also mentioned about evaluation of students you know examination system we are aware of what we said to some of uh, not only memory based questions but uh, higher level of understanding of the subject be it uh, in terms of uh, the fundamentals foundations the basics but also application of that what is learned in terms of uh, analytical ability data analytics and also creativity all of this has to become part of the examination reforms which has also undertaken and then, these atal academy programs although they appear to be meant for higher level of uh, some of the subjects or emerging areas like ai iot machine learning deep learning robotics 3d printing blockchain augmented reality virtual reality each one of these subjects have great applications almost all facets of life of the human beings and that's why how do you make use of this learning and then apply it into real practice is what our teachers have to do so during this one week program lot of exercise lot of uh, you know tutorials are given we will be given some assignments please take them seriously and if you are able to capture the essence of this you have to progress forward in your own ways later you know we have the internet where you have all the information available but one of the challenges for teachers is how this information is converted into knowledge knowledge into wisdom i think that no internet will do it and that is where the role of the teacher uh, starts off as a mentor as a facilitator he is an actor on the stage we say in the classroom so all of this a faculty member will have to start exploring himself or herself and then give the same exposure experience to our students in our classrooms if you are able to do and give some of the challenges you know our smart india hackathon is one of those places where students are given challenging statements and they come out with solutions we are not giving anything and then we may tweak with the solution in order to make it more robust more uh, acceptable more uh, you know creative but nevertheless original solution comes from young minds and how young minds are to be trained in becoming innovative is another area which uh, these eight modules of teacher certification is taking shape atal academy is conducting them constantly and i'm sure uh, if we all put in our best we will transform the education landscape in our country through the new national education policy and in the future the students who are coming out will not seek jobs they will be able to create jobs you know, they will be having so much of enthusiasm through the learning that they have that they would be in a position to create jobs for the country and make uh, our country happy their family is happy but also the world happy and uh, that is what we say sarve jana ha sukhino bhavantu is the philosophy the spirit which uh, we have imbibed so that we could become means the world is one family we are truly following that in our respect this will make our country vishwa guru in all respects thank you very much namaskar thanks a lot sir for stressing the importance of indian values and the holistic educational initiative that Atal Academy and AICT is taking all along. Uh, with this, uh, we come to an end to of this inaugural ceremony. Um, it is yeah. by. Yeah. Uh, but Pratika, I would just express my heartfelt uh, gratitude to Professor Rama Murthy for sparing his valuable time and some of the points which he really, really brought on floor. Absolutely, echo my sentiments. I have always been believing that it is the teachers who have. the lasting impression for generations because you know they are the one 
who finally are uh, uh, इनको बोलेंगे निर्माता यू नो हमारे समाज के हमारी कम्युनिटी के हमारे देश के और सृष्टि के सभी के वो निर्माता है बहुत लॉन्ग लास्टिंग इंप्रेशन है और टेक्नोलॉजी इंटरवेंशन अगेन सर हेज टू बी सेड दैट यू नो व्हाट टीचर्स कैन डू सो टीचर्स फॉर टीचर्स विद इफेक्टिव टेक्नोलॉजी कैन ट्रूली बी ट्रांसफॉर्मेशनल एज इनेबलर इट इज अ पावरफुल टूल फॉर दैम एंड देन इंडियन एस इंडियन वैल्यूज ऑल ऑफ अस आर ट्राइंग कि हम अपने देश पर अपनी संस्कृति पर अपनी भाषा पर अपने पहनावे पर अपने राष्ट्र पर अपने रीति रिवाज पर अपनी सभी चीजों पर वर्क करें और अपनी अगली पीढ़ी को इनका किसी प्रकार से गिफ्ट देते हुए ले जाए इन्हें आगे ले जाए तो धन्यवाद सर मैं पूरे मन से आपका दिल से आपका हार्दिक धन्यवाद करती हूँ और हमारे जो माननीय अध्यक्ष है उन्होंने इसमें जो जोड़े हैं बहुत ही उनके बहुमूल्य वचन है जो उसमें उन्होंने जोड़े हैं तो ये बहुत ही सुंदर समागम है भाषाओं का एक बहुत सुंदर समागम है टेक्नोलॉजी का और बहुत ही जो हमारे टेक्निकल मिस एरिया है धन्यवाद सर आपके समय के लिए आपके बहुत बहुमूल्य वचनों के लिए और सभी लोगों को इंस्पायर करें धन्यवाद अब विद द परमिशन ऑफ द चेयर वी कैन क्लोज द सेरेमनी थी थैंक यू ऑल पार्टिसिपेंट्स फॉर अटेंडिंग इनग्रल सेशन नाउ आई रिक्वेस्ट डॉक्टर बालाजी सर वुड यू लाइक टू कंटिन्यू द सेशन और वी विल मूव टू द क्वेश्चन आंसरिंग सेशन आई वुड रेदर लीव दैट डिसीजन टू द डिस्क्रिप्शन ऑफ द organizers and audience <laughs> uh, sir i request uh, you kindly 5 uh, 10 uh, minutes you just uh, kind of summarization kind of whatever is your opinion and thoughts you can do that and then uh, we'll move over further the question answer or if uh, some points are uh, left some ppts you want to exp uh, explain you can continue with that also no problem at all till 11 uh, uh, till 12 o'clock uh, or even whatever we can continue and uh, as per the question answers from the uh, participants we'll check it out so you may start please uh, all right because you know i really don't want to stretch the, uh, uh, the participants uh, time already they have been undergoing my presentation and with no break uh, inaugural and all that so all right fine so i'll move on uh, because you know uh, we are not even uh, half way through uh, my that is slides actually so uh, but that uh, fine you know, whatever we will try we'll cover it in this presentation okay so i'm going to share the slide from where exactly we have left out uh, i hope uh, the screen is visible to you dr deepak yes yeah. sir it is visible oh, very good thank yes, you yes sir yeah so apart from the uh, research studies that we have done uh, we are also of a practical relevance we also spent some time in understanding the uh, marine renewable resources available in our country uh, this is a sincere report i think for the past more than uh, nearly 6 years of time that we have been making and of course we started actually getting uh, noticed in the international area and as well in the marine renewable energy we have of course uh, estimated the power potential i mean electricity generation in the in the, in the gulf of kambat and kutch regions where the tidal currents are actually very strong we also have mapped the uh, wave energy within the exclusive economic zone of our country and we are also pushing our uh, you know expertise area in mapping the other regions of the country as well so uh, Uh, as a as a you know academic institution we are also part of the international uh, uh, forums several of the international forums where we also contribute from our side uh, and we also learn from their experiences you know the experiences of the other academic and research institutions so we also learn from them uh, yes i think this is a part and parcel of our um, academic business i as i always say that you know uh, knowledge uh, dissemination is one part like i do it today this way from the morning you know i've been trying to share you know what we have been doing but apart from that we also share uh, you know what we have learned we share it to 
uh, the solvers, you know, the solvers, you know, also maybe they will also have given some kind of indication how much they have uh, learned it in a hard way so that, you know, we don't have to spend too much of time on that actually. So I personally have involved in a huge number of knowledge sharing exercises. I think maybe in the long run, some of your participants or you can also think of actually joining hands with us uh, in any, every uh, possible academic way. So we have organized this number of workshops, uh, exchange visits, not just me, but I also take along with me young scientists from uh, uh, research institutions, young uh, scholars from uh, academic institutions, uh, faculty members from other institutions as well. And the faculty members from the overseas universities also have visited scientists from other uh, countries, the research organizations are actually visited as, you know, we, we uh, put these, you know, some of them are actually hands-on training, we give, uh, we had actually one interesting hands-on training, in fact, the field measurement exercise also, to have uh, some kind of hands-on experiences for the interest to play with the oceanographic equipment and so on. So, yeah, we also have organized number of workshops in the past, uh, global level, uh, or uh, when I say, say global level, you know, it is mostly related to the coastal engineering community. So very restricted in fact. So, uh, actually, okay. Yeah, uh, this one particular uh, uh, slide uh, for which we have spent a lot amount of time, but then the event was actually just less than 12 hours of uh, program I'm talking about. This. <clears throat> but this also has uh, uh, kind of demonstrated our uh, uh, the so-called uh, collaborative capabilities, you know, how multi-institutional effort, research institute uh, efforts can be really be successfully made. I, maybe I'll show you the glimpses of that very quickly here. But this was completely uh, spearheaded, uh, conceived and coined by us, IIT Bombay, and then we of course passed this message to other teams and they also have very happy to accept our proposal and then we have launched actually a very interesting field measurement campaign along the coast of uh, Puducherry. If you are actually good in geography, Puducherry is actually com completely enclosed by the entire Tamil Nadu state. It's also one of the maritime uh, you know, territory. But the whole idea was actually conceived by us. And then we also had very interestingly four other uh, institutional partnerships. Uh, we had uh, ITMAM, it used to be called as ITMAM before, but now it is National Center for Coastal Research and CCR, and National Institute of Ocean Technology, uh, and the National Institute of Ocean Technology. Of course, we are talking about representations, you know, not the entire institute as a whole, but we had very good representations from these institutions. And we also had, uh, luckily, you know, our uh, Taiwan counterpart collaborator uh, was visiting during that time, so we scheduled this program. <clears throat> But the common goal was actually to measure the near shore hydrodynamics. So only one particular thing. Then we mobilized all of our men and material to that particular location. Of course, using our own funding. This The whole exercise was not funded by anybody else except the individual uh, agencies uh, available funding. So we mobilized all our men and material. We deployed all of our uh, equipment as much as possible and we collected the data from morning six o'clock to till evening six o'clock or particular day. I think this was done in 2017, if I understand correctly, four years ago. Mm. So of course you can see some pictorial representation. There are multiple instruments. I am, I'm showing it uh, here only the glimpses of that here. We had MCCR director and uh, we also have a representation from NIO and NIOT. So it was a very interesting exercise. Of course, there is a lot of uh, uh, detailed uh, so-called nature dynamic features that we have captured that we are actually now trying to uh, compose if you are compiled into a journal paper <clears throat> into a journal paper and so on. So this was also sent as a small short note to the ministry as well, you know, this uh, entire joint exercise that we have successfully carried out was also sent to a ministry as a short note. And uh, this has just been, uh, you know, an extension of for the previous slide, and you know, having seen our effort uh, uh, that you know, five institution effort that we have put in to understand the uh, hydrodynamics of the measure, then we also spent our own um, you know, uh, manpower and resources to extend the monitoring alone as, a institute, as an academic institution. Of course, there was a small amount of support from NCCR and NIOT, but actually, they did not supply any uh, men and material exclusively for the extended part of the project. So, in the same uh, project region, we have uh, continued to do some kind of, uh, you know, uh, monitoring. I think that there is a, a unique project, a coastal 
engineering project that was actually implemented by National Center for Coastal Research uh, on, uh, on behalf of the MOES to restore the beach partially along the Pondicherry coastline. Uh, I think it's also called uh, sometimes Puducherry. So it's a basically a small Union territory uh, completely surrounded by Tamil Nadu American state. So <clears throat> it's a small city of its own and they used to have a nice beautiful beach and they have lost it over the time. Uh, yeah, let us not go into detail of uh, what caused the, uh, you know, the beach erosion and all that, but eventually the beach was completely lost and all the tourist attraction is completely known. So the government wanted to restore the partially the beach back and there was a design by NCCI, which is a kind of a hybrid model that, you know, you have some kind of a hard solution, thermal relief implemented and subsequently, you know, enhanced by the beach nourishment. Activity. So in nutshell, this is a whole project as such, but our part was actually to monitor during the execution of the project, you know, how not just only the hydrodynamics, but also the uh, the uh, morphodynamics actually evolved over the time. I'm not going to show the results of the uh, final outcome because it is yet to be published in the, in the channels of public domain. So, and it is still under the communication, so I will restrict myself you know, not to give too much of details about that. But in general, this is the overall idea we have we measured bathymetry during the construction and also after the construction of the uh, coastal protection measure. Uh, thanks to NIOT and NCCR, they have been monitoring monitoring. And our effort was actually to see whether we can, one side we establish the uh, field measurement campaigns and other side do some kind of a numerical modeling to see whether we can uh, estimate the long-term uh, or maybe short-term, you know, if you can't actually the short-term evolution of the morphodynamics within that region. Very short region I'm talking about, I think not more than three kilometers along the coast. Even the details about the beach nourishment, which was going on at that point of time, I think this project was uh, happening uh, between 2017 uh, and nearly 2018, if I understand correctly. Yeah, the beginning, I think somewhere in the month of April of 2017 to beginning of 2018. So during this period, we have multiple measurements, uh, measurement campaigns and uh, multiple data sets collected uh, and all of that will actually go into our model. And we can even, uh, you know, uh, distinguish which part of the uh, material being introduced as an artificial nourishment because the, the artificial based nourishment is basically going to uh, happen uh, from a drudges. Drudges uh, can't really come very close to the coastline to create beach, but then they'll stay slightly away and then they pump the water like a rainbow, I mean, uh, like a jet. So this will come as a natural slurry form uh, along with the water. And then this material will be available for the near shore dynamic to disperse it along the coast. So this, we wanted to actually mimic that in the country. Well, uh, yeah, our experiments uh, that we have done using, uh, you know, uh, GPS fitted the drifters to capture the surface currents, we found some very unique uh, and also a uh, very interesting uh, coastal feature. I'm talking about very close to the source zone. Okay, so which means the waves are uh, just breaking and these are the locations where even your conventional measurement, like, you know, deploying any ADCP or any ADV would be extremely challenging, number one. And uh, number two, the, I mean, in terms of depth I'm talking about, and also there is uh, one particular experience of our own during one of our field measurement campaign that the ADCP which we tried to install was actually toppled by the breaking wave. I mean, within few hours of after we deployed, the, the ADCP was completely toppled, which means, you know, it fell down on the ground, which you'd never notice, you know, because we deploy and uh, all the data is going to be stored within the uh, SD card uh, present in the ADCP. And once you retrieve, only then you will realize that there is no data in there. Okay. So, uh, this is one of such kind of experience that I'm talking about. There are several such experiments where we have deployed and then retrieved the, the uh, equipment after a week or two weeks uh, with zero data. Okay. Of course, these disappointments are actually quite happen and are quite common in the field measurement campaign. But what I'm trying to tell you, it is going to be even more challenging and complex when you speak about uh, the uh, breaking zone and then swash zone. So that's where we use the uh, uh, low cost uh, you know, GPS drifters we want to capture the currents. There are, of course, uh, it is also okay to capture the near shore currents at the surface level for the simple reason is that the currents are nearly uniform in the vertical column. Uh, unlike your uh, 
unlike your uh, situation slightly away from the initial region where the water depth is 10 meters or 10 meters where you are interested in uh, measuring the current profile at various water column here the water depth is 1 meter or you know not more than 2 meters you know we are talking about such a you know shallow water the currents are fairly uniform throughout the water column all the way up to your bottom so it's okay and practically relevant that you know if you capture the surface currents you can more or less assume that that's the kind of currents even also at the bed level okay it is not exactly the, the same but at least you can make some kind of a guesstimate or approximation there that you know it is it can be assumed that you know that kind of current is also prevailing in this field level so we did this uh, 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 surface current capturing uh, in field measurement campaign three different season of course we have done it multiple times but i am showing it actually in three different seasons but even the season actually uh, gave us a very interesting insight into the uh, influence of the season in the dynamics also for example the one that is actually projected on the left top corner is uh, march which is pre monsoon and then we have one in uh, july and uh, one in december as well so actually uh, uh, southwest monsoon and then also north northeast monsoon time what we observed unless we have this uh inferences or maybe the observations from the uh, uh the from the institute directly i am sure none of our model will be able to capture this uh, the information that we really looking for or seeking for apart from the current uh, direction changes there are influence of the locally generated winds i mean the very strong from land to sea usually the winds are very strong from the open ocean to the land that is quite common known to us when you go to beach you know you will always realize that but during the south uh, west monsoon especially in july month that our measurement has told us that the strong breeze from land towards open ocean has actually changed the dynamics of the surface currents in the vicinity of the uh, swash zone i'm talking about especially south zone so this basically gave us a totally different uh, you know so called our perception has changed you know so far we have been thinking about long shore current being either north to south or south to north but this is totally different for us you know it is actually northeast like completely going to some kind of a northeast direction it differs all of them and with a lot of suspicion we have repeated this experience and whatever i have projected here is only the representative or so called you know um, uh, typical picture we uh, with a lot of doubt you know we repeated this experiment number of times and we observed a similar trend and then okay i think then we went back to our computer and checked you know why the numerical models were not able to capture this even then we found that the model that we have established is exclusively for wave current interaction as an wave tide interaction but never wind okay wind was never in picture in our uh, thinking process i mean usually it is very rare to think that you know coastal dynamics uh, wind being influencing and all that so then when we introduced the wind externally and then uh, we also have uh, run the model and found that we could really mimic uh, what was actually really observed from the institute machine the reason why i emphasize that here is that so without making genuine effort to understand the uh, physical process that really happens in the open ocean then it is really hard to transform that or hard to uh, establish that in the computer model yeah. so yeah that's the reason why again we approach all these models uh, from a holistic uh, Uh, like i said before every single field measurement exercise uh, will be challenging to us and uh, i honestly accept even to my staff and students at uh, times that every effort that you make to make something uh, in the field you learn uh, apart from the data that you collect successfully then you learn at least one new thing when you come back home uh, to iit bombay so one time you know we were about to lose some equipment at that time you know we are about to drop something or you know about we have lost mobiles and things like that so so these things will actually teach you keep teaching you i think this this is though it is a really learned hard way you know after you know having uh, lost something like that but still it is going to be a lifelong lesson probably when we venture out to the sea next time to make a field measurement uh, then we will be very cautious how to handle mobile how to handle your gps how to handle your current meter how to deploy in a place this particular uh, photograph that you are seeing on the screen is actually one of our field measurement campaign that we have done it in the uh, river actually it's a river name called purna uh, it's in the south gujarat district uh, navsari uh, if you if you know 
you know, geography, Mumbai, then up north, you know, immediately after that, there is another district, coastal district in uh, Maharashtra. And after that, you go to Walsad, and then up north, uh, Navsari, Surat, and further, you know, you go inside the Gujarat coastline. And, uh, so I'm talking about south, along the south Gujarat coastline, and where the tides are actually very strong. The location where you are seeing these equipments are actually kept is more than 10 kilometers towards the river. Uh, from with respect to the river mount. Okay, so the river is actually draining to Gulf of Kambat or open ocean. So from that point uh, where the river meets the ocean to this place where we have kept the instruments is 10 kilometers. Okay, so you may be wondering what a ocean engineer is actually doing uh, here in the middle of the river. Okay, so this is the location, very classical example of how the natural dynamics can really be visualized are even really realized okay so during monsoon the rivers are actually flowing full absolutely no problem you know they are river like river like any other river okay so just i wanted to give an example of uh, how uh, the normal days uh, post monsoon after several months you know you will have very small amount of discharge actually flowing in the river and all that okay you let it be like a december or january whatever you might have seen the river flowing from upstream to downstream. This is nature. And this is how we have studied in our fluid mechanics or hydraulic engineering, open channel flow, all of them, right? This river, 10 kilometers from the river mouth, will flow from downstream to upstream during part of the day and upstream to downstream for the other part of the day. And Believably, it is a fantastic piece of place where you should really spend some time at least six hours or something like that. The effect of tides in these regions, the tides are actually very high range, more than six meters of uh, range. I'm talking about the tidal level due to the celestial body attraction, the tidal level can really go up and down. It's so strong in this region that the tides will, tides from the open ocean, they enter through this river mouth and they come all the way up to more than 20, 25 kilometers upstream of the river. Very strong. So you will see the river flowing in the reverse direction for six hours and then original direction for other six hours and alternatively every single day with no holidays declared 360 degrees. Very interesting. So we, of course, for some other, you know, project purpose, you know, we have, uh, you know, established our test session, everything and all that. And that's the first experience for us. And we were under, we have underestimated the current uh, speeds about the tidal, uh, you know, uh, intrusion in the river. Now, of course, these equipments, you know, when we deploy in the uh, open ocean bed, we anchor them, you know, we add some additional weight to these, uh, along with the steel frame. This uh, equipment will be mounted on the top of a steel frame with a lot of weights, you know, we put them on the bed so that they'll sit pretty based on their weight, just with their weight alone. I think the weight of the equipment, the weight of the frame and the additional weight that all that we have put in was nearly 150 kilograms. We thought, you know, this is never going to be lifted up by the river and all that. It was lifted by the tidal currents. I have seen that in my eyes that, you know, it was dragged upstream. I mean, it is taking inside the land and towards the upstream of the river. With great difficulty, I just wanted to tell you that we have retrieved this equipment. Of course, forget about the data. There was no data lost and all our uh, efforts are actually gone on that particular day. We had to visit the place again the next day. That is what a different issue. But the hard lesson that we have learned was the underestimation of the natural uh, force here yeah, was a good lesson for us. So, so, of course, you know, every, every field measurement will have its own, um, you know, uh, challenge and lesson learned from that. We also had an interesting uh, uh, work on the Tanai Creek. Uh, yeah, this particular one photograph you are seeing at the moment on the left corner, we have spent the three complete years, but just only one photograph I'm trying to show you to you. We have continuously monitored uh, the uh, coastline of South Gujarat coastline, of course, uh, for about 150 kilometers long. Uh, there were a number of uh, anti-sea erosion um, uh, you know, uh, projects was actually implemented. So funded by Gujarat government, you know, we were actually monitoring. There are several parameters that we have measured. It may not be uh, so much interesting to you and time is also uh, you know, not helping us. So I just wanted to tell you that, you know, three years of effort, I'm just showing it in one single photograph. We have, we have volume of data 
that actually gave us a huge amount of confidence that we can build any theoretical or analytical model on top of this now in fact we have also published a paper maybe if you are interested i can share that among with you that the how uh, the, um, uh, the the impact of the sea walls actually also going to either actually helping us or maybe something like you know some kind of a small amount of negative impact that sometimes you know we may face uh, it is not fault of design or it is not fault of anything but it is sometimes you know quite naturally happen at some some places not all places okay, so even those small uh, information you know were the uh, the observation and uh, those things were actually uh, inferred actually in this uh, particular project yeah yeah so this is what i was talking about you know you usually uh, place your uh, uh, adcp or current meter in a large frame and then uh, what do you see as a chain no the steel chain they are nothing but additional right now in addition to that we also have the side along the corners of the uh, bottom corner of the uh, each frame we also additionally put some weight as well yeah this is another challenge uh, when you when you want to really go out to measure uh, something uh, during a foggy or monsoon sorry uh, monsoon or maybe even summer winter days you may have to wait for the uh, fog to clear but by the time the tide would have gone back you know you may have to come next day again so there are such uh, interesting experiences as well for us yeah i'm not very sure whether we'll be able to cover all of this uh, yeah maybe, yeah so i'll stop yeah. here yes sir yes sir that, i think we'll do that sorry because of that half an hour it went for 45 minutes that inaugural part uh, that is the reason but uh, yeah sir can we move towards question answer sessions then absolutely uh, yes yeah, yeah. at least we'll try to take uh, one or two so that uh, participants can get the answers yeah uh, okay thank you ma'am thank you sir now i request uh, aboli madam to uh, start with question answer session yes thank you ma'am uh, good afternoon so there are few questions in the chat box and we'll uh, uh, we'll just see one by one so first question is Uh, to what depth of water and wave height kazan type porous breakwaters can be used okay so i think uh, if you are talking from uh, the uh, uh, port or fishing harbor construction perspective uh, the water depths can be anywhere from 5 meter to 20 meters up to that level but it's not necessarily to be specific i think there are cases in which uh, the kazans are actually Uh, built even as a coastal protection structures where the water depths are actually very small but then the cost aspect and other uh, functional requirement is what basically dictate the type of breakwater that we select to use yeah. i think if i understand correctly there are other resource persons are going to be speaking about the coastal structures exclusively okay thank you sir so the next question is why is physical modeling in coastal engineering important is it only to validate numerical model results or any other importance i at least uh, uh, speak about the importance of the physical model uh, for about one and a half hours to my students okay <laughs> so so i'm sorry but uh, yeah apart from just validating Uh, it may not be really possible for you to validate all the coastal models using simple experimental uh, facility based data sets okay for example if you have actually uh, the uh, innovative structures like i was mentioning about the concept of dual energy kazan there is no other option other than testing it in the laboratory because it's a new concept and you cannot you cannot prove the concept uh, validation through numerical modeling because the numerical model itself is going to be questioned okay so the physical model tests are actually very much essential component as part of your innovation number one number two of course many of the equations that involve uh, empiricality very simple example i think we also have a representation from seoli terrace the design of seawall cross section and breakwater is established more than 5 uh, decades or 6 decades ago the same equation remains same in mean, the same equation wherever everywhere in entire world but in spite of the fact 
though the equation was well established there were hundreds of project already in place uh, existing construction project has already been done infrastructure has been done we still insist that the designed cross section to be tested in the laboratory before being implemented mandatory it is mandatory in many of the contractual obligations it is mandatory that you should at least test typical cross section in the laboratory even though the equation was well established there are thousands of project has already been built in the globe using those equations but still we insist that as a contractual obligation it has to be tested in the laboratory once before it is for the simple reason there are number of empiricality involved in that please yeah okay thank you sir uh, our next question is the model used for estimating siltation in navigational channel of mumbai uh, jn port is 2d or 3d mathematical model uh, we have done actually both in fact yeah so we begin with uh, we did it the uh, we did it uh, with the two dimensional model and uh, we also have three dimensional model. and uh, one more question sir do you notice any bed load movement in mumbai harbor those uh, measurements were not actually done but quite naturally if the navigation channel is getting silted up it is it is combination of both bed as well as suspended load combination okay hope the answers uh, are pretty clear to all the participants uh, there are few more questions but due to time constraint will it be okay for you sir if we mail you those questions and uh, so that the answers will be conveyed to the participants yeah what is the time is really limited you know we can do that i don't have any problem yes i request all the participant to post their questions in whatsapp group so that we'll be conveying that to sir and uh, the answers to that we'll forwarding it to you also i request all the participants to find the attendance link in the chat box and are kindly requested to give their valuable feedback for the session thank you thank you aboli thank you sir now i request uh, our hod dr deepa joshi madam to give vote of thanks for this session thank you ashwini ma'am uh, first of all i would like to thank our resource person Dr. Balaji Ramkrishnan, Professor at Department of Civil Engineering, IIT Bombay. So, thank you so much for your wonderful session and the valuable knowledge sharing. In fact, you shared the important successful research projects, and that was really, uh, uh, I would say, the better way to uh, make aware the participants who are faculty as well as industry people also uh, that what kind of projects are being uh, done under this particular area. thank you so much sir and uh, also i thank you for sparing your valuable time with us and uh, i would uh, like to thank iit bombay for sparing their valuable resource for this fdp and i request uh, dr balaji sir to uh, will uh, to continue his association with our department uh, thank you very much sir and at the end of course i uh, thank all the participants Uh, for attending this session uh, asking the questions and i'm sure there are more questions but we are not able to take it right now however we'll convey those questions as well as answer to the participants uh, again uh, thank you so much sir thanks thank a lot thank you thank you so much dr deepa and i wish actually i should have explained more the number of slides that i still left out but time constraint yeah. is always happening like that so it is not going to be the yes, end sir. but it is beginning as i believe always that right. you know it is just a beginning you are more welcome most welcome to uh, send me email or you know through uh, dr deepa you can always communicate to me for any of your yes, research collaborations and stuff okay yes definitely thank you. sir yes thank you thank, thank you, you so much, much. okay thank nice all the participants you know they were very quiet actually all the time <laughs> <laughs> take care thank take you, care sir. all of you stay safe and all the very best thank for sir. the entire program yeah. fdp program Thank yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, all participants, I request you to provide registered mail ID and phone number for marking the attendance for the session. 
our next session will start on time that is 1 pm so i request all participants to join prior 10 minutes for every session with the same zoom link and make sure you mute your mic while joining after uh, ma'am excuse me yes yes uh, ma'am for me my registered number is so showing wrong uh your register number is showing okay. in that case ma'am uh, you just uh, convey uh, an email to the coordinator we will look after that okay thank you ma'am okay okay ma'am thank you yeah participants after marking your attendance and feedback you can leave this session and on time you can start with next session 